The following is a presentation of the Force Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is the Force Center podcast feed, and this particular episode is the Book of Boba Fett report. I am very excited to be reporting on Chapter 3. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm Ken Napsack. We are here for a deep dive discussion, a look at all the things around the show, and a look at Space Vespas. Space Vespas. I'm glad that uh, you had that thought. I'm sure many other people did. I was watching it, really enjoying how colorful they were, and like, there's a specific word, a specific Earth phrase that is spinning around in my brain. What is it? <laughs> and I suddenly bolted up on my couch and thought, Vespa. That's it. That's it. As we know in Star Wars, just throw space in front of it and you got what you're seeing. That is a huge part of the magic. We spend a lot of time discussing all of the roots, the DNA of Star Wars. And some of it is take Earth stuff and make it space. And that is a, a very fun and thrilling uh, part of it. A nice whimsical part of Star Wars. We are very excited to dive in here into uh, Chapter 3, titled The Streets of Mos Espa, written by John Favreau, directed by Robert Rodriguez. About 35 to 36 minutes of real, actual story. Uh, we always like to set the scene as fans uh did you watch at uh midnight as usual uh i did almost straight up midnight in fact i i had it uh queued up at 11 59 and it uh, popped up and I, I said uh grace the new bubba fed is here the new bubba fed is here and uh, <laughs> you ran to the couch you were like an old-time news kid uh with uh waving the paper <laughs> yes yes get your piping hot boba fed the phone books are here indeed yeah a lot of fun yeah, yeah, it is. It's very funny how much it is immediately available at midnight, and it's only been like two years of Disney Plus, and I'm always like, remember the old days when you used to have to try to trick it into playing the new episode of Mandalorian by playing the previous week's episode and then seeing if the new one would autoplay because it's not showing up. Remember those old dark days two <laughs> years ago? I remember, yeah. November 2019, yes, yeah. Texting friends that first night. I've got it on my phone. I, do, I have it on the Roku, but not the PlayStation. <laughs> I got, TVs. I have it on a tablet. I have half of it on a tablet and half of it on a phone. If I put them together, I can maybe watch it. Yeah, it's a new day, new day, different time. Yeah, um, I stayed up until midnight as I always do, but I kind of had a weird thing with my system because I had to get up early this morning uh, to take my wife uh, to the airport, uh, which in Los Angeles, where I live, is a two-hour adventure. Mm. Uh, so what I did before I watched uh, Book of Boba Fett is I tried to really put myself in Boba Fett's place, and I took a big nap. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> and I really enjoyed that because sometimes I'm like, ah, I, I want to, like, I don't want to be just waking up from a nap at midnight. I want to be, like, really engaged, really pumped, really excited. And then it was nice to be like, you know what? A part of this show is about letting things come to you as you nap. So I, as a little kid, when I was like, Boba Fett's so cool. He's the baddest bounty hunter ever. He's got knee darts. You know, when I thought about pretending to be Boba Fett, one of the things that I ever thought I could be to be like Boba Fett is napping. That was never one of them. So I'm very happy for this new reality. I love it. I also think uh, I finally got to see, uh, you know, what I look like when I wake up in the morning with back pain represented in a fight with Black Crescent. So <laughs> that's me. So yeah. Yeah. No matter how I woke up this morning, uh, it was not as rough as Boba Fett had to wake up in this particular episode. Uh, so we're going to get into it. We love discussing all the big ideas and themes and all of the fun details of the action, and the comedy and the canon lore connections. But we always like to start with the, just a big overall reaction. We've both really been loving this show. What was your overall reaction to this chapter, Ken? Oh, uh, here we go. Here we go. This is the weakest book of Boba Fett episode ever, ever in the history of all three. This is the absolute worst episode. There's my ranking. Done? <laughs> oh, the show goes on. Um, now, look, I, look, I sometimes get a little grumpy that every week have to, uh, you know, every week has to be the week Star Wars content either dies or lives, right? Uh, now, we're going to have a little bit more of a serious, serious discussion of something bigger in this episode, but uh, there's a lot of things uh, that uh, people may like or not like about this episode, and, and I'm with you on that. Um, but uh, it's just sometimes that's what I dread more than anything of like, uh, is that Vespa gang going to ruin Star Wars? <laughs> According to some headlines and that kind <laughs> yeah, of thing? Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so here we are. But my overall reaction, uh, yeah, this is the one I've, I've, I still have the most issues with, but I still went to uh, sleep dreaming about some of the big moments, some of the bigger questions and, and important themes, which is why we love coming to Force Center to have those kind of discussions. Very blessed to be able to uh, get into the Force Center uh, bubble and uh, dig into the stuff there. And, and I have to admit that years prior, Maybe in those days of 2019, uh, November, I, I might have scrawled in blood on my bedroom walls. The primary cus- color Vespa gang must die. I, I, I didn't uh, love them on uh, initial viewing. Um, I do, at the end of the day, like some of the color choices. Uh, and I've, I've heard, heard and seen and uh, uh, felt a lot of the jokes about Back to the Future 2 gang and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I see you jokes. I get it. Um, their design is, aesthetic was not my favorite, but that's just also the biggest issue. What they represent hit from the beginning for me and I really love their presence in the show. So fun discussion to say like, Hey, cool. Uh, enjoy the other two a little bit more. Here we are on the third episode. What's in there for me. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely understand, um, having to take some time to parse this episode. Um, we'll talk about, uh, one of the bigger things. Uh, but uh, for me, just the actual, the, the space Vespa gang, the space mm-hmm. Vespa kids. Oh man. I love them. Uh, we'll talk about the idea of these workers that Boba Fett is sent to uh, uh, manipulate it into uh, yeah. uh, supposed to attack, <laughs> basically, right. and then he partners with them and uh, what they mean and how they fit into the most ves- most Espa, uh, not most Vespa. <laughs> most Vespa. <laughs> I oh. accidentally made a joke. My mouth made a joke without my brain being involved. Right. Ah. The most Vespa gang, uh, how they fit into the community of most Espa, all that stuff is important. I just really loved their aesthetic. I thought that they were the Star Wars's answer to the cyberpunk aesthetic, which, you know, a little bit of that has been around in comic books and, you know, books for Star Wars. But I just feel like that's such a history of Star Wars is to grab different genre ideas, different pop fiction ideas and put them through the Star Wars filter. So this idea of a a, a group of young people who are like, look, we don't look at the galaxy the way you old people do. We don't have this great separation between organic and uh, and and droid. Uh, There's some there's some uh, benefits to having both. And we want to combine them. And it's got that attitude as well as just the physical aesthetic of having a cool body parts that do cool things, you know? <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm, cl- I'm very with you on that. Uh, yeah, no, I love what they're saying. Uh, you know, and, and uh, yeah, I, I made uh, in my notes, made even a, a reference to uh, Gen Z arrives in Star Wars uh, and calls Boba Fett an old man. Uh, loved all that. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, just some of the, I think against the backdrop of Tatooine, they really stood out and that can be their plus or negative depending on how you, how you look at it. Like uh, if, if you're on another planet, a, a more urban environment, I think this would fit right in. But I think that's also kind of the point. So that's why I'm saying there for it. And then some of the chase, we'll talk about the chase itself. I actually liked a ton of it. It just, it was a little different than maybe you might expect it. And that's, and Star Wars sometimes does that, right? It's like, uh, I, it's interesting, even my own journey. I love Amy Sedaris as a performer, loved her for years, uh, X57, Stranger with the Candy. Didn't love Pelly right away. Didn't love what she was doing. Thought her tone was a little off. Pelly shows up here in a cameo spot. And I was like, it's like, it's Pelly. Look, it's Pelly. <laughs> I think Star Wars, if you're really invested in it, does have a way of doing that. Where it's not that you're just reevaluating things. It's just a, you know, new could be new could be strange. And then when strange becomes somewhat normal, you start to see the other sides of it. And I, I think I'm gonna go on that journey with this gang as well, to be clear. And by the way, I want one of those Vespas. Oh, I definitely want one of those Vespas. I think for me that what I liked about the Vespa is I feel like uh, the space Vespas is I feel like they were out of place on purpose, right? Uh, they they had that attitude of like, we don't have money, but we spent money on this or mm-hmm. found a way to make them look like this. They feel like the tradition of uh, not just cyberpunk, but punk of all kinds of, I don't feel like I have much control. I don't feel like I have much agency. I don't like this gray, beige, depressing box that I have been forced into. So I'm going to find a way to scream. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, I loved hearing uh, comments from people uh, when they're asked about like uh, at all sorts of different ages of punk or rock of like, why do you do weird things to your hair? Because, like, because it's mine and because I can and because it reminds me that I have control. And when I saw those space Vespas, it felt to me like uh, th- I, we live in this beige, depressing town and mm-hmm. I have agency. I'm going to make some color in my life. 
Yeah, look, and I've I've seen some of these uh, references online, so it's certainly not my only thought here. It, it, the the mod culture in uh, England popping up and uh, being a lot of inspiration for the designs here. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the band The Jam with Paul Weller. He's called the Mod Father. Like it, it's just kind of uh, something that's real. It's there. Yeah, and I, I think that was effective uh, for for me as well. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So I think uh, other than being excited about the uh, most Vespa gang, uh, I think for me, I really did like this episode. I think that it was a little bit more uh, maybe table setting, which I know sometimes people can get uh, frustrated by. We came off of last week's episode that felt like it really, in the flashback, told a very complete story of how Boba Fett uh, truly uh, works with this community and is accepted by this community and gains strength from this community. And it felt like it's such a beginning, middle, and end. And I feel like this uh, chapter is one that feels much more like a chapter in a story. It is introducing many thread threads it clarified some threads that have been around mm. uh it's in it was really table setting in terms of setting up the these parallel battles that i feel like are coming in the past and the present uh the past most likely with the uh the nikto gang the mm-hmm. kitten striders um and possibly the pikes more on that and in the present uh definitely the pikes but it was very much like it had its own arc its own themes its own adventure but in terms of plot it was really like uh, climbing up on the diving board. Oh, great. Yeah, great way to look at it. Uh, another image of water and uh, and a man in his underpants. I love that. No, uh, <laughs> I, 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 no, I agree with that. And even when it ends, I remember, I, you know, because you look again, you look at the runtime, right? Last week, it was like, oh, 52 minutes. This week, it's like 38. Oh, okay, we're back to that. And then so when, when he says that the final line of, all right, well, then we're ready. I'm like, and scene. Yep, up oh, there it is. <laughs> and uh, we're really picking this up, I would think. So, yeah, and again, sometimes that table setting is very necessary for these kind of uh, – uh, serialized connected stories uh, and sometimes on an, a week to week basis I made that joke up top but yeah on a week to week basis sometimes you you're like well that's the Star Wars I got for this week and and it's felt incomplete to me and and that can sometimes affect your uh, your takes uh, uh, on the on the episodes on the first viewings yeah and I think those things uh, it, it yeah it is about first viewing reaction and the, I waited a week and I'm hungry give me as much as possible right <laughs> uh in those things I think do fade with time when you can just sit down and binge them right you know yeah. I don't think somebody who has hasn't seen Mandalorian season one at all and just binges it is as concerned with how much plot was advanced in chapter four right that's yeah, yeah, it's yeah. more of a concern of of the the week to week I think yeah. um the other thing that I really liked big picture about this episode is I think or this chapter I think it's been clear since the first uh chapter that these are intertwined parallel stories mm-hmm. um in in from the first chapter it was clear that the parallel stories were emotionally connected uh particularly in that first chapter, I really thought Boba Fett was going through similar things and trying to find strength from a memory of the past where he had regained a little bit of control in power and was trying to do that again in his crime lord mode. But I feel like in this chapter for me, there was real clarity that these stories are going to intertwine, like not just emotionally, but actual plot events and players, right? Mm -hmm. Um, The implication that, uh, maybe both of the past and the present is going to be about a conflict with the Pikes. Is does he literally want to be a, a crime lord because in Tatooine to eventually address unfinished business with the Pikes feels like um, not mm-hmm. something that I'm predicting. That is for sure going to happen. But <laughs> this chapter makes me makes it feel like a possibility to think about. And I feel like for me, there's this clarity of we know his motivation uh, in mm-hmm. the present. He wants to rule Tatooine with respect. Yeah. But why? And it, does he have a goal outside of that, like outside of that uh, sort of emotional thematic statement of this is mm-hmm. more the way the world should be and I'm going to try to make it this way in an area I can control? Or is it also that he has an actual objective? Is there something in his past he is trying to set right by being the crime lord of this specific area? Yeah, and then it starts to seem seems to be, I should say, uh, starting to become more clear. Uh, a little Boba Fett long play, as well as uh, changing things along the way. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, we talked a lot about the big thematic. Uh, I was going to say thematic goals of Boba Fett, but I don't think you walk around going, "I have some thematic goals." You're just living, you're just changing, you're just growing. But as a story, we're seeing that, and yeah, I think that was one of the things I really enjoyed about this episode is a lot more time in the present. Uh, a lot more time with uh, Chris Hinton, but uh, a lot more time just seeing what's actually going on. And then, yeah, Pike's all the way through, and uh, I, I'm with you on that. 
Awesome. Awesome. So uh, I, I think probably in the overall, we should talk about uh, the passing of the the Tuscan community. Um, uh, for myself, uh, I'll start out by saying that I think uh, a lot of people saw this as a possibility of what was coming. Uh, so I wasn't surprised. I think it was effective from the point of view of Boba Fett's story, uh, but I still was bummed out about it. I know that there were some people who were uh, concerned that this was coming. Uh, for lots of different reasons that we can uh, discuss. Uh, I thought it was emotionally effective, um, but there was also that that last chapter for me was so thrilling to really get to know these characters, and it made me want to buy action figures of mm-hmm. these specific Tuscan, uh, you know, community members that we're meeting and wanted to see the next adventures of some of these characters. Um, so it, it was uh, hard for me, um, and we can talk about it more from there, but that's my kind of starting point. Yeah, uh, right, right there with you on on what I thought was uh, effective in the story. We're often here to engage with what's in the story, but obviously you go online and uh, and we can we can you know take shots at the discourse online. This is not just simple Star Wars discourse. This is uh, this is uh, a lot of people affected by this story and and some of the, in this plot point in a negative way. And I always think and this is more for myself uh, is when you're scrolling through that to just just when when a large amount of people. Are, are upset and I'm not, I'm not even to say angry, but and some are angry, but just upset and disturbed by it and, and not happy with this uh, just to stop and, and take that in and listen. And that's, that's not a bad thing, a bad starting point to any kind of discussion around this is just saying, look, um, uh, this is affecting people as it should in a different way, in a more powerful way. And even though we can say, yeah, yeah, look, uh, this is probably coming down the line that that might've been what the, the, the problem was right, and I think there's some some very harsh realism in this moment as it uh, has played out throughout history in our real world time and time mm-hmm. again. I'm sure it's very powerful to Tamora Morrison uh, and what he brought to that scene, but also sometimes maybe that's not necessarily what we need. We need maybe something else and 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 more nuanced the discussion and more respect to these characters. I totally am there for that. They did such a good job the previous couple weeks. That uh, fallout from this was, uh, to me, if, if it, it was going to go this way, was unavoidable. And, and maybe it should be unavoidable. These are valuable discussions that I'm seeing there online. And, and I think my place in it is just to look at it and go, yep, there you go. Let's hear it. Let's amplify it. Let's understand why. And maybe we can all move forward a little bit stronger as a Star Wars fandom. Yeah, I think that is very, very well said. I think that my takeaway is that it is extremely nuanced in its uh, worthy of examining from lots of different uh, perspectives, uh, talking about it from the context of the, the show and the, the story mm-hmm. that the, the show is trying to tell, uh, being aware that the there is a very huge real world importance because the Tuscans are so coded as, you know, indigenous Mm -hmm. people that have very much very clear relationships to indigenous people in the real world the fact that the tuscans in star wars have this long history of having a lot of the negative uh these negative stories uh about the concept of of being indigenous and what that means to settlers and how settlers view them and the mandalorian and then in particular boba fett has uh, you know given them so much uh, more perspective and let us know them is, uh, you know, true, true, uh, a true culture with a true mm-hmm. and valid perspective and all that. Uh, so that's really important that that great thing happened. It's important that Timur Morrison himself is indigenous. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that the writers aren't. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think it's all really important to look at all the different pieces. And I think for myself, I really want to seek out and listen to the voices of indigenous people take in what they have to say, how they are affected uh, by these storylines in, in positive ways and in negative ways. And I want to listen and learn. And I think that's the main thing that I would, um, I would encourage other people to do, because I do think for myself, there are, uh, there are things that are just like opinions about star Wars of, you know, should raise lightsaber have been a different color, right? That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a fun star Wars uh, discussion. Uh, and, and you can have strong opinions about it, as I do. Uh, I like I like that yellow, golden color. But then there are those uh, Star Wars conversations that have such deep impact on the real world in such an immediate, almost one to one way in this situation that you have to be really respectful mm-hmm. of those conversations as conversations that affect Star Wars, but are also larger than Star Wars. Uh, absolutely, and and look in this uh, digital age 
Star Wars pop culture punditry uh, a place that we are we are so happy we're in it. It's so much fun to do week to week. I think sometimes it becomes um, it's easy, and I, I I'm guilty of this too. Of where like uh, I love Solo so much, and if someone says something bad about Solo, I'm like, let's go out in the street and let's fight. Uh, and, and your guard goes up in so many ways, and we we're just so used to that that even if you hear someone saying, "Hey, I'm a fan of this show. I'm a fan of what they did in episode one and two. This really hurt me. This upset me. I don't like this." It, you immediately you're, you might have the reaction of, oh, "Are you attacking Star Wars?" And it's like, "No, I'm a Star Wars fan, and I want better for the franchise, and I want to feel um, getting more out of it uh, for the franchise because I'm here because I love it, and this is something I'm feeling about it." And and I think it's okay to to stand down <laughs> and just nod like Boba Fett and Jabba's <laughs> Palace and go. Got it. I hear your point. Please keep talking. Uh, it only, again, makes us all, all stronger there, too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think for me, in terms of just analyzing this as storytelling, I think, and how it intersects with the real world, I think this is one of the really big, important takeaways to me of there is a little bit of connection between Solo and Boba Fett in mm-hmm. Book of Boba Fett, the movie Solo and the television show Book of Boba Fett. Uh, because they're both stories that uh, have an ensemble, certainly, yep. uh, but they're also being clear that almost every other character exists to serve the main character, either Solo and or Boba Fett. And yes. then when you have diversity, that's wonderful. Uh, but then when the character, the, some of the diverse characters are, are you know, there, what what happens to them, good or bad, is all being filtered through the main character, then you start to lose the perspective of the diverse character. And it makes sense for the individual story, but it's not great for the big picture of our, of our culture and our storytelling. Right. So I I always want to have nuance about that of like story structure wise, we can understand why that happened. And for me, that makes me say, this is one of the reasons that I want and I advocate more stories created by diverse voices, focusing on diverse characters So you don't have so many instances of diverse characters being structurally affected by not being the main characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're saying it more beautiful than I can say, but just, yeah, the solo effect is a a great example. We've had the discussion about Val in in particular, just like, yeah, you're going to have powerful moments, powerful characters, but they're always going to seem shortchanged when they're they're serving, um, you know, one particular character, even more than one particular story. I think that's... Things right, and and it's uh, it's uh, it's again worth discussing about how we get to those points. Um, again, in my mind, I'm thinking they're probably thinking, hey, you, hey, you know that you kind of that that real world horrible thing that happens. What if we what if we examine that and put it put it in front of us? And then it's sometimes it's like, yeah, we, we we get that, we get that, we've studied history. Let's try to find another way to have that discussion. Let's try to find another way to use these characters or involve them, not use them, but involve them in the story. Uh, I, I, all of that is very fair and and, uh, and powerful points. Yeah. And and I will just clarify for myself. I'm, you know, I'm talking about Solo and Boba Fett structurally. I know that this is a more complex issue Mm -hmm. uh, because again, Tamar Morrison himself is indigenous and I, and I want to listen. I am not an expert on those issues and want to listen to other people, but I also want to clarify, I'm kind of talking structurally about that main character thing and want to acknowledge that difference. Um, I think the kind of last thing for me, Ken, is I think for the rest of our podcast, I do want to engage with what happened, uh, the the tragedy with the Tuscans in terms of how it relates to this story of Boba Fett, uh, this show of Book of Boba Fett, um, but really want to have a a big asterisk (laughs) by everything else we're going to say that from from this point on for me, I'm just going to acknowledge uh, how it functions in the show, what's emotionally effective or not, with a big caveat that I'm bummed out and want to listen to a lot of other voices about it. Yeah, and acknowledging that the conversation should and will go on about that, not just with us, uh, especially not with us, but with a lot more other people in the Star Wars uh, fandom. Uh, but I'm, I'm there with you on that uh, as we discuss it for this episode. Yeah, absolutely. Any other uh, big picture thoughts before we dive into details? Um, the, the, you know, the biggest uh, thought I, I have is that just, uh, you know, I'm ready for the spin spinoff as he runs <laughs> off to uh, enjoy his uh, newfound lease on life. And we've seen some of those shots that show like how far into the desert he is. He's got, he's got a lot of running to do and he wasn't going straight down the road. He was taking a side road. Uh, yeah. 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 I kind of wish you had run straight down the road. So for the rest of the conversation, you saw Chris Anton just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, my last thought is obviously uh, is always in this uh, sort of Mando verse uh, the John, of John Favreau Filoni uh, at all uh, that they're creating with Mandalorian book of Boba Fett. It's always great to see uh, different surprise actors uh, pop up. Uh, Stephen Root is obviously great. Yes. But Danny Trejo is, he's so 
perfect for this world. There's a part of me is like, did anybody cast him or did he just manifest? Because, <laughs> you know, the, the, there's his energy fits so well. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, you know, Robert Rodriguez is a second cousin, right? So, uh, and, he, and, he, and he has him so many things. It was only a matter of time. And I'm, we're going to talk about it later. I, I think it wasn't, it was both a fun, like, hey, and a very poignant and powerful use of Danny Trejo, uh, which is why I love Star Wars, right? It's 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 those type of things. Uh, you and I always talk about the silly and the and the spiritually profound uh, Star Wars. And, and this was a great, great use of Danny Trejo. And I'm such, I'm such a Steven Root fan. Um, when he showed up, I'd be like, I'm having an old brother where the art thou flashbacks, news radio flashbacks. And I just, I, he's such a good performer, such a good, and it, and it worked for me. It really worked for me. And I just enjoy Steven Root there. Oh yeah. He, he knocked it out of the park with that character. Yeah. And I loved your saying, yeah, Dan, Danny Trejo's uh, role as a, a new Rancor keeper is, uh, it's fun, but it has a great depth. And as I was driving home from the airport, uh, I, mm. I passed, uh, Danny Trejo's donut shop. <laughs> <laughs> and it's okay. fun to now think of Boba Fett when I pass that donut shop. Yeah, not a sponsor. I haven't been to the donut shop. I'm a donut fan. If, if you like tacos, you need to do yourself a favor and get to Trejo's Tacos. I, I mean, the first time I experienced them, I like sat there with tears in my eyes <laughs> on, a, on a table outside the patio. I was like, I can't believe what I'm experiencing right now. So, yes. Absolutely <laughs> beautiful stuff. All right, then let's dive into this chapter for you. What were the big themes? What big ideas were at stake in this particular chapter of Book of Boba Fett? Yeah, there was a lot in this episode to be clear and some sub themes. And I love that. I, these are two that jumped out to me. Uh, I'll, I'll list them. Then we can get out dive in. Uh, how do you use power is the big mm-hmm. theme in there for me. And then what you are is not who you are. And uh, what other people think of you is not who you are as well. So two big, powerful themes there for me. Uh, we can go where you'd like to go. Yeah, well, let's just uh, dive in because I think uh, I might have phrased some of them a little bit different, but I think mm-hmm. we're on uh, on the same track. Uh, for me, there was a lot of examination of what kind of leader is Boba Fett. I love that you're talking about like people kind of trying to pigeonhole him and tell him who he is. But for me, there was a lot of really putting a focus on this question of what kind of leader is Boba Fett going to be? Is he strong? And within that strength, uh, how does he define it? Is it violence? Is it mercy? Is it a combination? Is it a combo platter of <laughs> violence and mercy? Uh, so let's dive in. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, great, uh, uh, great uh, sentence up top of everyone is waiting to see what kind of leader you are. Uh, I think Matt Bear said that is 88, right? Uh, and, and that kind of is his theme. And I, I, power, and I, I choose the, the word power because power is mostly connected to the, the big bads in Star Wars. Mostly, mostly because that Palpatine guy made it such a dirty word. Um, and, and in a lot of ways it is, uh, but I do believe Star Wars analyzes power, uh, down to the micro level and all through our lives. I'm talking about you, me, Joseph, everyone, all through our lives, all through our days, we, we all at different points might have power and it's not just a title, it's not just position at work or in the job, but you know, you might be in the power seat in certain relationships and job situations. Maybe you're the one telling a, a young kid at Subway how to make your sandwich. And there's <laughs> a, that's kind of a position of perceived power. And how do you use it on every level? Do you to build up? Do you use it to help? Do you use it to calm everything down for the betterment of those around you? Uh, and beneath you, or like Palpatine and a lot of others, when you push towards the dark side and you're fueled by greed, which is that big word you and I have talked about a lot recently in Star Wars, um, does it, uh, is you are using that power to just inflame everyone else around you for the sole purpose of you? Steven Root's character, Lortha Peel, is this great example of, uh, you know, him, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, these street toughs are running wild and crime is on the rise and they're, oh, they're half man, half machine. So evil, right? Uh, and uh, really it's because they're cutting in my profits and my power. Uh, and I don't want them gone. And, and that's how you use the power versus a lot of other ways you're seeing it used in the series and how Boba Fett is clearly trying to use it. Even if there's a bigger picture at play that we might learn more of, and I feel we are, I agree with you on that. Uh, he is using it in a much different way and he just needs to show everyone what kind of leader he is. Yeah, no, I really love how clearly it is set up that everybody is waiting to see what kind of leader he's going to be, that uh, 8D8 thinks that's clear, uh, that Lortha Peel even acknowledges the great moment in Chapter 1 where Boba Fett's like, I'm going to walk on my own two feet and I'm going to encounter, uh, I'm going to have face-to-face connections with all my vassals and it's going to be about, uh, I'm going to show them this new kind of strength that is respect. Well, no, I almost got assassinated and everybody thinks I'm weak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I achieved the exact opposite of what I wanted. I wanted to project strength. And now he's in this position because of that. I love that Lortha Peel actually acknowledges like, you know, and after the assassination attempt, you know, I don't think you're weak, but I'm kind of telling you everybody else does. Um, uh, one of my favorite themes is just him going, I mean, I'm insulted for you. I was insulted <laughs> for you. 
oh, it's such expert, expert manipulation that I love it and also want to punch Lortha Beale. Uh, <laughs> Trying not to be violent, but uh, yeah. And I, I love it that most, es- uh, that most Espa, that uh, 88 even has that early beat of like, trying not to say Jabba's name because he thinks Boba Fett will feel threatened. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> but yeah. just the name of that superior leader, right? Um, yeah. In yeah. terms of people reflecting back to him who he should be, um, I, one of the things I really love about Lortha Peel's manipulation, uh, Lortha Peel, the watermonger, mm. is that it's not just disrespectful. It's not just greed. It's that he thinks Boba Fett is so weak Mm. that he, Lortha Peel, can manipulate Boba Fett to not be his daimyo, but to be his personal debt collector, right? Yeah. He ends that speech by saying, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, you know, uh, rid rid us of this scourge and I'll double my tribute. Mm. And at that moment, like so many other people have done to uh, to Boba Fett, they're trying to bounce him down from leader Mm -hmm. back to bounty hunter, right? That's Mm. basically just Lortha Peel going, I know you think you're the leader, but you're just a violent hired gun and mm-hmm. I can offer you money to take care of my problem. He's trying to make Boba Fett a bounty hunter again. <laughs> Absolutely. Can I hire you? I mean, I mean, can you do me a favor? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I this is all about you and your leadership, but mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll, I'll pay you a little bit extra if you take care of my specific problem mm-hmm. that's gotten into my profits. Uh, yeah. And then I also really like that the, uh, the, the, the Vespa, uh, uh, girl Drash, I believe, yeah, yeah. Uh, it is also really starts out by telling him who he is, right? You're a crime boss just like the rest of them. So mm-hmm. that one isn't even so much about like, ooh, are you strong or not? Basically saying like, you're a dime a dozen. We've seen a million like you and you're going to come and go and then there'll be another one just like you. Yeah, and all of you use your power to continue to oppress us and uh, break us apart and uh, put us in this position that we're in. And uh, yes, we believe in uh, st- choices in Star Wars, but uh, we get it, old man. We get it. Yeah, yeah. In in terms of this leadership thing and the way that the flashbacks uh, continue to inform the present um, in a very sad uh, discovery mm-hmm. of the the Tuscan horror, mm-hmm. the. It, to me, it is meaningful that one of the Tuscans that we've very see specifically fallen is the the leader, right? Mm-hmm. And, yeah, yeah. And Boba Fett, you know, it's really uh, we'll talk more about the the sequence of of staffs and that uh, sad burial. Uh, but I feel like that was another way that the episode really sort of framed that this is what Boba Fett is on Boba Fett's mind of what does it mean to be a leader? Mm. Yeah, the, t- the the true burden, the cost, and and how yeah, best to do it. Yeah, yeah, how, how best to do it. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and for me, uh, I, I'm curious to see how this dovetails with your thoughts. Mm-hmm. I really thought this episode focused a lot on Boba Fett putting into action even more this idea that, yes, I want to project strength. I know I need to project strength. I'll use violence if I have to, but I would far rather use mercy and connection, right? Mm-hmm. Um that he is not building, he, he's not building his power by just killing people and taking stuff from them, right? That mm-hmm. he is, gets manipulated by Lorth Appeal. And instead of using violence against Lorth Appeal or against the Mos Vespa gang, he turns them into allies, right? Yeah. Uh, and then there's this sort of like um, big pileup of all of his acts of connection and mercy and respect that we've seen so far of when he's attacked by Chrysanthemum. Everyone who shows up to help him is someone that Boba Fett showed mercy to or mm-hmm. extended a helping hand to, right? Uh, mm-hmm. he, he rescued Fennec, uh, this uh, biker gang. He gave them a purpose and showed them that he was somebody different. The Gamorians, who, are, who kind of have a question mark hanging over them mm-hmm. because that's not the way it's supposed to be done. And even his friend Fennec's like, this is a mistake. It's not feeling like a mistake uh, right now when they're saving his life from Chris Anton. You know, it's so powerful that he lives because of the strength of his mercy in this chapter. Yeah, no, great stuff. I think it dovetails quite well. And and, and if I made a note too about the Fennec thing, uh, she she's so great. And and again, this is a, a a character in a Boba Fett show. So you know, one day I'd love to have Fennec just kind of talk over dinner about a lot more things in her points of view in life. But I love. Uh, I love that a lot of times she she's the one going. This is not the way to do it, and 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 in many ways it probably isn't. But Boba Fett's fighting against that, uh, and and it is working. And I love 
uh, hear me out here. One of the things about episode one, chapter one of this, um, uh, you know, uh, chapter one of Mandalorian, we are given this gift of Baby Yoda and how that becomes, uh, you know, this big driving point forward in Mando's life and drives all these changes. And I, I've heard some people understandably say, oh, well, the chapter one of Boba Fett it had such a, fib, a similar formula to Mando uh, chapter one and Mando overall season one, I would say. But it didn't have that big moment at the end. I still think at the end of that episode, he has given his life. He, his, yeah. his, his, how he defines victory and how he breaks his chains uh, over there with the, with the Tuscans in that, in that first episode. That is what's changing him. I have this. What do I do with this? And I love that you keep seeing these connections from his past. You're so right to say that we keep going to the shot of a connection to his father that we know is broken. We know that, you know, who knows? That might be the, the, when he's flying off. Uh, to go meet Dooku or, you know, flying off to Corson to meet Sam Wessel. But uh, the, the, <laughs> the point is, it's just, that's his father flying away. The reflection chains to him. This great connection with the Tuscans. I also love that the, you know, even referring to them as Tuscan Raiders is no longer what I would describe as fair. Tuscans of the Dune Sea is mm -hmm. so much more true and so much who they are. And his connection from there. And then that is now, uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, this painful moment is he, that connection is destroyed. And so now he has his life back and he's going to look at it in a different way. I don't think Boba Fett of Return of the Jedi uh, doesn't uh, does anything other than wipe those kids out. And he, his, the gift that he was given was his life, and 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 now it's changing him uh, going forward. And I, I, I'm here for that spiritual journey of Boba Fett. Absolutely, I think he has had a real redefinition of what strength means. He still believes strength. I love that he is. We get to see him at that um, uh, buffet. I love that we always talk about Star Wars buffet as having lots of different kinds of storytelling in Star Wars. And here in this episode, <laughs> mm -hmm. we saw a literal Star Wars buffet. Uh, with Boba Fett and Fennec. But I liked how much Boba Fett was concerned about everybody's looking to me to see what I do next. He knows he needs to project strength. It's just his idea of strength has changed, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. His idea of strength, absolutely. And uh, you and I asked the question in, in chapter one again, how do you define victory? And, and uh, uh, that also connects to, you know, what do you define strength? Because uh, that's maybe how you go out and get victory and yeah. you approach it. Anyways, yeah, yeah. And, well, and that's that's something that I don't feel I feel like the this chapter raises a question that I don't think we have answered yet. So I'm really curious on your thought uh, mm -hmm. when I was really thinking about, OK, everything we're talking about of what kind of leader does he want to be? Well, he needs to be strong. But what does strength mean to him? How is he defining that? We see in this chapter that he benefits from finding connection, showing mercy. He releases uh, Chris Santon. Uh, he kind of disapproves of Fennec just going straight for the death threat to handle the yeah. major domo, right? It's very, very consistent in the present that he's willing to be violent, but it's, it's only under these conditions. Now, if you connect back to the flashbacks, which are obviously informing the, the present, mm. he took the Nikto's gang's speeders by force right mm -hmm. there was no attempt to work with them he just went in and granted they were already in there yeah. <laughs> harassing innocent people who lived there so i'm not saying that he uh he was wrong to defend cammy and fixer <laughs> but what i'm curious about is is he going to end up blaming himself for what happened to the tuscans now i think he's certainly going to go out and try to get some sort of vengeance or justice but the the Tuscans told him there are many different groups of us uh, and some survive by attacking. We hide. Mm -hmm. And he came in and said, you don't need to hide. Let's be big and loud. Let's take their machines. Uh, he used his physical strength. He took those speeders by force. He took that train by force. Uh, does he blame himself at all for just using force that that ended up with this new community, this new family uh, suffering for his actions? I, you know, uh, I, I hope he comes to the realization that uh, the the Nikto's choices were not his, uh, right? Uh, but yeah, how could you not think that in that situation, right? Um, we're rooting for him here, and I think they do the right things, and I think he's right of all the things he says to the Tuscans. It was so inspiring. But yeah, I, 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 I think I think I agree with that that sentiment that that maybe that's something we could potentially explore with Boba Fett, and that uh, changes some of the actions going forward, particularly the one in that in that. Um, in the mayor's office, right? Yeah, the heavy-handed was a good joke, but it also was, uh, this is, again, this is Boba Fett. And he's like, 
The fact that you even kind of threatened with the blaster, I don't know about that. I mean, who is this guy? He's changed. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and how could you not look at that? Uh, again, again, how you use your power, the Knicks was using their power, and, and even going to, to Mando uh, season two when he shows up, he, he got no problem using his power against the stormtroopers because he he feels it's, it's for good cause. Uh, but yet his honor and his code was very much in place, which one which one of the things we all were discussing back then. This is violent Boba Fett, but he has a code. Oh, like his father. So, yeah, I, I would love to uh, – that scar is going to run deep. Yeah, yeah, and I'm just really curious to see where it goes. I'm not saying necessarily that that is absolutely going to happen. It's just a real question that was raised because I think that the flat, the events of the flashback in the events of the current crime lord era are always connected in the fact that he was realizing that there were ramifications of his actions. Is that a part of what makes him question? Like, i got to be strong, but when at all possible, I need to – you know, make allies, not enemies. Yeah. I, yeah. And, 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 and t- that you're so right with that fight scene there, there's a collection of allies he's making. And one yep. day my guy, Santon's going to be there too, by side. I, well, yeah, I mean, he, he, it was either let him go or kill him. And he was, mm-hmm. of course, let him go and uh, no hard feelings. Uh, I think you broke several of my bones, but <laughs> <laughs> no hard feelings. I mean, fair enough. You probably have a hole in your, in your yeah. Wookiee back. <laughs> An ankle. Yeah. You're not, yeah. Santon's not yeah. great. You're never, yeah. Great. Not, he, yeah. yeah. He had a rough day, too. Um, I think uh, for me, one other big theme that I want to be sure to highlight, which was um, I think all the leader stuff is is right there for sure. But I think what I was affected by emotionally the most from this episode you were touching on uh, about his father, I really felt like this was this uh, in this episode. There was a theme of losing and finding connection. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've seen all these flashbacks uh, to Camino. Uh, this we saw this during his trial last week. We saw it again. That great, powerful. Uh, my my father is leaving. I'm I'm losing that connection. When will my dad be back? Obviously, I think the huge emotional stake for Boba Fett in losing his Tuscan family. He had found connection, right? Mm. Um, in in such sadness of honoring. Uh, all three of the individuals that we saw him connect with mm-hmm. uh, by placing those staff so the leader the warrior and then the the, the training stick mm-hmm. of the child was a real he a reminder and and again as always we're caveating this with it, it deserves larger discussion i'm mean, just talking about how it functions in this story and affects boba fett um that that's about lost connection for boba fett right mm-hmm. um and then that so much of this episode is not just about him like showing tactical mercy and and uh, building alliances but on a deep personal level, Boba Fett wants to connect with that rancor, right? Mm-hmm. And what I feel like this story is, is that Boba Fett is not running from his formative trauma anymore. He's trying to heal from it. Mm-hmm. Like when we see young Boba Fett in the Clone Wars animated series, uh, it feels like like many youthful people, he's trying to find his way. He's trying to be big and strong like he thinks he's supposed to be and he has some lessons about honor and aura sing versus what his father would do and uh, asajj ventress making a more honorable choice on a bounty hunting gig and all that but mm. we we still don't have some details of his his full formation into the badass bounty hunter Bobby, boba fett um but it seems to me that this is perhaps a story of him going ah strength is being the toughest the strongest being able to kill anyone who steps to you and in that he's running away from, you know, emotions that could be perceived as weak, right? Mm-hmm. Of wanting connection in that this experience in the Sarlacc has really changed him of like, this is what I've been looking for my, my whole life. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'm an orphan. I was kind of a clone. I was kind of a Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. I was a bounty hunter, but that I, I didn't really successfully get family from that. Now I have family and now I am open with myself that that's what I want. I'm not going to let any, if somebody tries to tell me that it looks weak for me to find the Rancor sweet spot and pet it, (laughs) I'm just going to stare them down and go, no, you're weak. This is strength. I am, I am, Mm -hmm. I am actively trying to find what I want, which is connection. I absolutely think that's a lot of what's going on here. Uh, the, the rancor represents so much in this, uh, other than just say a rancor, uh, it represents so much to, to the core of this story. And I, I, and uh, as far as the the connection, you you mentioned uh, uh, there's um, you said something about strategic like strategic mercy or something like that it's it's I think Boba Fett's getting so much out of these connections he's forming now, 
hundred percent. We see that in action, but I, I, I would argue, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, Joseph, just like a lot of the mercy he's showing is not in direct. It's not ex- a direct exchange. He, he knows, like, Hey, if I show you mercy, will you fight for me? That's, that's a value to Boba Fett. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I wonder if the Gamorrean Grounds were like, I don't know. He might've just said, all right, cool. They, they go black or set. He's not telling black or set. All right, I'm going to let you go. You're now on my team. He's like, go, go, go live it. Go live your life. Uh, I'm not asking my mercy. is not, uh, is, is not conditional here. Uh, and I think there's some of that going through Boba Fett again. Is he getting things from it? Yes. But I think it is more natural reward uh, because he's fostering these connections now. And it's so true. That's uh, the, the whole scene of just, it's cute. Number one, it's damn cute. I think I found his spot. <laughs> I think he likes this. <laughs> um, but yes, take that scene and play it against what you're talking about. These this powerful, uh, uh, tragic at, at best uh, loss of the uh, of the Tuscans. Uh, the 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 same repeated shot of him running after his father as his father flies away. It's so clear uh, the, the connection lost. I, I think you're onto something there. Yeah, and I just felt like all of the discussion uh, between. Uh, Danny Trejo until we know his space name. I don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to Trey that. Danho, uh, uh, <laughs> whatever his uh, wonderful Rancor Keeper Star Wars name uh, will be. Maybe it's emerging as we're recording. The The conversation between him and Boba Fett about the Rancor, how much the Rancor is just a kindred spirit to Boba Fett. And that's part of what it's dawning on Boba Fett, right? When uh, it's to start with that great, it's depressed. Um, and uh, the Rancor keep us saying Rancor are emotionally complex creatures, right? That to mm-hmm. me is really Boba Fett being like, everybody knows me as the terrifying mask and that's what I became yeah. for a while, but I am an emotionally complex creature, right? And, and Boba mm-hmm. Fett says this great line, Ken, I thought they were bred just to fight. So that's a great thing about a Rancor. That's a great thing about Boba Fett, but it hit me like that's a damn clone mm-hmm. saying that that mm-hmm. however much he claims the mantle of clones, he exists because millions of people like him were bred just to fight. And that mm-hmm. is, it, that so powerfully connected it to that. I thought they were bred just to fight is Boba Fett talking about the rancor, but thinking about himself. Yes. And they're quite peaceful and less threatened. Uh, no, this is great stuff. This, I, I, I submit this uh, and I want to, I want to have a little uh, discussion here on, on uh, Trejo himself and the use of him in this scene. I, I submit that this particular scene for me might end up serving uh, the uh, Quill rebuilds IG 11 and tells you all about it scene, um, <laughs> which I still contend is the heart of uh, definitely Mando season one, but Mando overall, this uh, uh, you were programmed, programmed one way, but if you, you know, and that's, that's, what's imprinted on you, but you can be rebuilt and you can find a new purpose. What you are is not who you are. And mm-hmm. this rancor seemed to be right now, right now we got this big core of, uh, of this entire uh, run. We'll see. We've got four episodes left. Oh yeah. I think this is the first of those scenes. Cause uh, mm-hmm. I, I would assume from this episode that we are going to have a beautiful rancor keeper. Boba Fett <laughs> learns to ride the rancor montage, which uh, I can't wait. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, it, and if I may, a little bit about the, the use of Trejo uh, and how- Yeah, please. I, I just, it, it was number one, entirely fun and, and, and cheeky. Trejo is just one of those people in pop culture now, whether he's selling donuts, talk, uh, tacos, or just entertaining you. He, it, so many people unilaterally love him. And that was not always the case in his life. And and uh, I, I think it's what better person to kind of show us, I think it was a genius use of him to show us that the circumstances- you're bored into the choices, even, even the bad ones you make, uh, from there and the, and the life you lead when the world only sees you in a certain light does not have mm-hmm. to define who you are inside, whether, whether it's then now or, or the rest of your life and knowing Treo's life, knowing the time, uh, spent in prison, knowing, knowing the, the abuse he suffered as his father, he's very open about a lot of this stuff and, and how he changed. Uh, I was even reading a little bit more of it specific down to the year, 1969. This is a, this guy's now been, been, uh, sober. I think it was like 40 plus years uh, and, and just think of how we've always viewed Treo and the roles he initially had to take uh, in, in Hollywood and, and this mean, imposing, dangerous, quote unquote, criminal type uh, and, and, and how that meant he was he was treated. And lit- again, literally in the roles uh, he was given. And here he is talking about this rancor who we even in the Star Wars. I was a seven year old kid terrified of a rancor. We as Star mm-hmm. Wars fans are taught that the rancor is the pit bull of the galaxy. Right. Yeah. And it embodies this theme. It's so, so powerful to me of having Danny Trejo sit and tell you, go, no, no, they're quite peaceful and threatened. And they're very complex uh, and, and they're looking for connection. And it, once those, uh, you know, the eye coverings come off, it's going to imprint on you. It's going to connect with you. Um, it's so powerful to your connection theme. And, it, and it's powerful to what, what I think Boba Fett is fighting against. You're so right. Even Sophie Thatcher, Drash saying, you, 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 old man, 
is who you are. Uh, you crime lord, we're going we're gonna to write you up because we've been written off. And it's this vicious cycle. And I think Boba Fett really represents this theme. Uh, the Tuscans of this Dune Sea were crushed by this theme. Uh, again, powerful discussions to have in the real world about that. I understand. But I, 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 they, they are viewed as the, the, these uncivilized raiders to be crushed and, and, and stomped over by people more powerful, perceived to be more powerful than them. And the freeing of Chris, Chrisanne uh, is Boba Fett fighting against that theme. The street gang, you and I have talked, so I, is, is this theme as well. Uh, so I just really love this scene. It really moved me in a way other than, you know, for me, again, I'm terrified. I'm terrified of the rank as a kid. When I was <laughs> theaters, I don't want to go back to that. Um, and I love, you know, I love Malakili. We talked about it on Data Bank Dive recently in The Companion. We talk about it a lot. Malakili, and I was so intrigued by uh, that man crying over the rancor, this vicious beast that just tried to kill Luke Skywalker. To use Trejo in this way, not just to be like, hey, Danny, you want to come down to set and be in a Star War? Yeah, 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 yeah sure, buddy. Um, it was a real genius and powerful and poignant use of him in that scene. And I love this scene. It's, I've already watched it five times. Yeah, no, I think um, I think this scene, it ties together a lot of the other ideas that are in this chapter and in the Book of Boba Fett show in general, but this scene is so powerful. It's such a great mix of, of yeah, there, there's absolutely some fun and some comedy to it, but there's so much depth and power. Uh, in particular, this, this line that the Rancor Keeper says of, uh, about the Rancors, they are powerful fighters, so that it is what most know uh, but they form strong bonds with their owners. The owner's mm -hmm. part of that is real specific to the relationship uh, that he's building with the Rancor imprinting on the first human. But uh, taking, you know, with the with their owner's part out of, they are powerful fighters, so that is what most know, but they form strong bonds. That's basically saying like, <laughs> yeah, one way to define strength is to be an unstoppable badass. Uh, but another way to form strength is to be honest with yourself, with your pain, with your humanity, with your trauma, uh, with your possibility for empathy and mercy and hope and forming bonds. And I didn't know all those details about Danny Trejo's actual life. I'm so glad you shared those. I didn't know those, but I just know Danny Trejo from the sort of uh, pop culture image of mm -hmm. he, this line about they are powerful fighters. So that is what most know that's been his pop culture image, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unstoppable badass uh, with a machete, you know, w you yep. know, he can, he can kill you with a look. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's was the Boba Fett uh, for years of the, the terrifying bounty hunter. So that is what most know. The rancor is, you know, kept in a pit and eats anything that's dropped. They're powerful mm -hmm. fighters. So that is what most, what most know that is uh, such a powerful line that connects all of these different characters and ideas that you are uh, you are highlighting, I think are all being represented by that line and about this discussion of what the Rancor really is. Yeah, no, the scene really moves me. Plus, cute little Rancor. I mean, come on. <laughs> cute, cute little Rancor. Uh, any other sort of uh, uh, ideas or themes in this particular episode, this chapter for you? Uh, yeah, you know, there's a theme of appointments and uh, how you get them. It's a powerful theme. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, I guess the the only other big thing is just the continuing importance of water, how much it's mm -hmm. being elevated as is how it exists in uh, Boba Fett's mind to the point that he's even having conversations with people about it. Uh, a big reminder that it is the life and death commodity that everything uh, centers around in um in on Tatooine, I even love it when the major domo crashes and knocks over the water tanks, and he's got that. He looks like he just destroyed money. It's like ah, yeah. water. Um, and I, I continue to think that that the uh, Bakta or Bactopod mm -hmm. is meant to be extremely womb-like, extremely amniotic, the mm -hmm. Freudian theory of the oceanic feeling. And what a great twist on that! Now that we've gotten used to it and gotten the sort of the comfort of we now know this language we go floating in there and then the film changes and we go back into the past we go into Beaufort's thoughts and then to get ripped out of that womb-like environment by a giant furious Wookiee was so great on building on those emotions and using them to make that moment powerful. It, it, Billy, uh, yeah, uh, Grace, I think, shrieked. Uh, it, it caught us both uh, unawares because you're so like, all right, here, oh, another dream's coming. What's going to, oh, no. <laughs> Time to wake up, Boba. <laughs> wake up, Boba. Time to die. Yeah, it's it's yeah. really shocking to be pulled out of that that place of watery comfort. Yeah. 
Yeah. So how do you feel like these big themes that we've been talking about reflect the uh, the larger story, morality, perspective of Star Wars in general? I, I, I For sake of maybe not having a three-hour episode, uh, I, a lot of it uh, is there. But I'm going to focus on this one here, Joseph. We can go from there. Uh, a bre- a oppression and abuse of power, how it squeezes down on the necks of those underneath it all. I've been watching Solo mm-hmm. a lot this week for a, a show. I uh, was fortunate enough to... We asked on the last minute to talk about Solo and just how that's this one of the big things that uh, you and I and so many other people love about the, the movie Solo. I think more than any other Star Wars movie, at least, uh, Solo really shows what the, the effects of oppression. It doesn't just say, yeah, the Empire's oppressing things. We, we get that. Um, but it actually shows the effects of it. And, and I think you see it time and time again here in this particular episode of Reflecting Star Wars. Uh, the, 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 the street gang, more, you know, it's this vicious cycle that they're stuck in. And they know it, and they and they can't get out of it. And and for Boba Fett to come along, it is it isn't just about a get get a job, young young kids. It's about let me try to let me try to break the cycle with you and for you, and and, and for the benef- better benef- benefit and betterment. That's what I'm trying to say of all. And I just think that is that is a that is a big thing always at play in Star Wars, and and to see it on the streets of Mos Espa at play in a lot of different ways, and uh, you know. Peel, uh, Stephen Root uh, representing a certain side of it, uh, the backstabbing, the protection deals here, one on the left, one on the right, uh, all the huts, everything at play. It all uh, speaks a lot about uh, the abuse of power in Star Wars. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think of that is uh, you're putting it in this great just uh, sociopolitical uh, context of there, there's a great thing with the with the street gang of like, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Like, we can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The system's broken and there's no work. Uh, and yeah, so great for Boba Fett to come in and like you, like a youth community leader and like, all right, uh, it's so great. But for me, that, that also has that element of just this classic Star Wars and many other storytelling, uh, examination of the cycles of violence of, you know, when is violence absolutely needed, uh, from the perspective of the character or justified or violence is a part of, of justice or defense. And when will violence just invite more violence, right? That's, yeah. So what the watermonger is trying to manipulate Boba into, and he sidesteps that. He has sidestepped it with the Gamorreans. He sidesteps it ultimately with Chrysanthemum. He kind of, th- he's not sure if, to, if he should trust the huts, but that's what the huts are explicitly saying of like, yeah, no, we don't want to just sit here and have a battle. We, we tried once to kill you and you got out of it. Great. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, here's a gift. Let's, you know, it, maybe that story will continue. But for now with the huts, that was a breaking of a cycle of, potential violence right it is you know bad for business is already a fun recurring joke because of the the twin sister but it's it, it's again uh it has a lot of meaning i really am drawn in by that of uh, these are these are huts you know for them to be like yeah, nope nope uh no, number one speaks to maybe the threat and the power that's coming down the, the 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 path here to try to abuse people more uh here come here come the pikes into the fight but I was really drawn in by the, no, we're good. We apologize. Uh, we're out. You should probably <laughs> so be out great. too. We did send him to kill you. We're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we did, did send him to crispo you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think another big thing that is uh, in this chapter and in, in uh, this uh, Boba Fett series in general is that idea of everyone matters, but in particular, mm-hmm. don't judge by appearance. We talked a lot about how that manifests with the Rancor, but I really liked that that was there with uh, the street gang, uh, the most mm-hmm. Vespa gang, that uh, the, the watermonger is really trying to, to paint it in classic Star Wars language, which we'll talk about, of, oh, there awful they're basically they're like they're violent freaks right and then both has trying to be respectful was like sorry i didn't mean to make an odd comment about your eye and just getting yeah. that that forceful pushback from i believe scad saying no i got my eye on purpose <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's uh i'm proud of it it's who i want to be it works really well for me is a great uh classic star wars everyone matters but really specifically pushing back on the appearance when it comes to the rancor mm-hmm. and uh the uh these uh, star wars cyberpunks i absolutely love it yeah. Last big picture thing for me that um, it's maybe part of a bigger conversation that I'm sure we can have at, at, at some point. But uh, I think for me, this whole show going through, can Boba Fett change? Who is Boba Fett really? Uh, for a lot of fans for a long time, he lived in the popular imagination is, a, you know, a really cool bounty hunter, unstoppable, uh, you know, full of weapons. Uh, and then here's this show that is about him trying to find his humanity and trying to uh, maybe be weapon second <laughs> yeah. as a, as a philosophy. I think that ties to me to like just a big idea of star Wars that uh, the, the bad people are people who made bad choices and 
it's not going to erase their bad choices, but they can always find their humanity again. They can always make a better choice, mm-hmm. you know? And for me, uh, a lot of Star-, Star Wars storytelling will always be informed by, you know, uh, the story of Anakin Skywalker and that this is somebody who made bad choices and uh, stopped <laughs> and, and at least made one good decision uh, again at the end of their life that yeah. it, Star Wars is always going to have an element of uh, you can find your humanity again. Absolutely, which is why I don't enjoy those uh, conversations that bog down the the redemption of Vader with, uh, you know, all the list of sins he's done. I, I've got it. This isn't a court uh, where we're trying Vader. It's this mythic tale of redemption, and, and I think that's valuable. Same with Kylo Ren as well. Uh, and so to see it uh, at play on, on the street level, literally on the street level, is uh, is what Star Wars should be about in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of the street level, we always check in on the titles. Uh, for you, Streets of Mos Espa, you spoke really eloquently about what the street gang means and about dealing with the real people of Mos Espa. Is that the power of the title for you? Yeah, absolutely. Other than just being a great 1970s Michael Douglas uh, Streets of San Francisco <laughs> spinoff. Uh, yeah, about just really what's going on out there. I mean, this starts with the 88 with this great, you know, map uh, scene of, hey, let me actually break it down for you. Who's uh, Let me throw out a list of uh, Star Wars species you, you know, but it isn't a bushel of member berries. It is, it is going, hey, here's what's going on out here. This is what you've now taken over. This is what's, what it was. And the people underneath there don't don't respect your leadership. So, you know, Boba Fett, I'm continuing. Number one, he's got skills. I get it. But even for him to just be like, great. Um, let's mask up, tell Fennec to mask up and we're heading out there. I'm going to the yep. street. Same. We talked about a lot with the litter uh, and the, everyone making the jokes or wondering where his litter was. And it's like Boba Fett has literally got his feet on the ground and that's going to make him a better leader and, and, and tell him and inform him how to better use his power. So I think that was a great use other than just a great seventies detective show. It's a, it's a great title. Yeah, no, and that that beginning where 8D8 is laying things out of what actually goes on, it's, it's so delightful on so many levels because as a Star Wars fan, I was like, yeah, they're just saying Aqualish on television. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah, used yeah. to be an obscure thing. And then also for me, like, I wonder if people are like, what, how, how many words in this episode do, uh, do non-hardcore Star Wars fans go, what are they talking about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's an Obadiah? What, where did you, is that, is that a medical procedure? What, what are you talking about? Um, but for the, what it means for the title, the theme, I love that this is a picture of uh, Boba wants to understand the community and that Mos Espa isn't just like, eh, it's a sleazy spaceport, like people say about Mos Eisley, whether or not that's true, but that it's this, uh, community that has balance to it and it's out of balance. Yeah, look, uh, not to dive deeper into more themes here, but going back to your connection thing, p- power, and again, I talk about how we all at some point have some sort of power. Power, power. one of the dangers of it is it disconnects you. And, and if you're in this position as leadership, there's a story, gosh, I apologize if I've told it before, but I'm a big fan of baseball and Ken Burns baseball. Kurt Flood, the late Kurt Flood, who who was in the uh, real, the, 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 the eye of the civil rights battles in the 60s and even rights as players to get out for the, the contract uh, of, of their owners, uh, and, and the start of free agency and, and, and went through, you know, separate, um, you know, segregation in baseball here, here is the biggest baseball star in the world. And he, he still had to stay in separate hotels and separate buses. And, and the white owner of the Cardinals, who was this great man who Kurt Flood loved said one day he asked me, he said, Kurt, are, you know, do, are you not staying in the same hotels as, as the other team? And Kurt Flood starts crying as he's telling the story because he just didn't know. He just didn't know. Mm. And, and that is the danger of power. It's not always Palpatine and the grab for evil. It is sometimes just like, hey, I'm, I'm doing my thing, right? I'm doing my thing. I'm telling the stories, and I just don't know. Going back to even the big issue of this episode, I, I believe in my heart that that, that Favreau and, 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 and Tamora Merson are telling something that they feel is pretty powerful, but to be maybe slightly disconnected from what that means to other, other people uh, it doesn't make you innocent of the charges. You know what I mean? Uh, mm-hmm. You have to get to get on the ground and maybe figure it out sometimes. And and I think a lot of that, to, to, to just tie it in simply into the title, is, 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 uh, is what I'm taking from this episode. Uh, I think that's very well said and a, a great story to to illustrate that. Uh, as we wrap up our uh, first half of our podcast here, was there <laughs> anything that you disliked your question that we haven't talked about yet? <laughs> other, look, other than some of the big things, right? Yeah, um, I don't know. Could the Vespas, Vespas have been just two colors? Could they be? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, you, I know you're a fan of it, so I'm going to follow your lead down it there. And I want one. I want one in, in figure form. I want one in real life. By the way, I've never ridden a Vespa. My roommate had one and I avoided it. I'm a little afraid of things like that, but um, I would ride a Vespa if it was like uh, Drashes and had, uh, I believe, 
800 rear view mirrors. Yes. He, by the way, he used to make fun of me not riding it or, you know, they want to take it out for a spin until he got knocked off of it by a car. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm fine with my decisions, but yeah, no, uh, other than that, uh, and the big, uh, the big issues around some the decision, um, uh, to at this point, uh, you know, a story will play out, but I, I do believe uh, the, the Tuscan, this particular Tuscan uh, village uh, and, and people has been destroyed. And, and that's a that's a big one. And it's uh, correct to question it. Uh, but other than that, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing about the Vespas for me, that's the space Vespas, which is really fun, is at a couple different points in Doctor Who history, there's been an attempt to make uh, the Daleks uh, colorful. <laughs> yes. so I feel like I'm familiar with this uh, pop culture battle and I can't wait to see how it plays out over here in Star Wars. I know how it played out in Doctor Who. Let's see how it plays out in Star Wars. Well, and, and the final, and fi final thing on the Vespas, it, 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 my first view in particular was not my favorite. I'm just going to say it wasn't my favorite. I bet within two years I will have a, a toy of it and proudly display it on my uh, shelf next to the puffer pigs that I hated with all my life. <laughs> it's just the way it works, man. Yeah, uh, it does happen that, that that way sometimes. But like, man, yeah, I don't know. I can't wait. I can't. Uh, I, I wish they were available already. I'd be yeah. smashing the buy button on uh, <laughs> on those toys. Uh, exactly in those brilliant, beautiful popping colors uh yeah final thing for me is uh yes we, we've we talked about uh, everything that happened with the tuscan story but uh, i just want to continue to uh be able to look at what what the story is in this story but even more importantly and how important this is uh to real world concerns to be respectful and listen to as many uh m multiple knowledgeable viewpoints on this story and its ramifications as i can yes listen it's pretty good. Listen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We are going to take a quick break and then we're going to be back to get into some of the canon and lore connections, some action moments, some comedy moments, all that great stuff in just a moment. And we are back to continue our discussion of chapter three of the book of Boba Fett. Let's dive into the canon lore connections to other stories. There was a lot of fun stuff here, Ken. Uh, we got a shot that we had been seeing in some of the teasers and trailers uh, of the Boomar monk just scuttling around outside of Jabba's uh, palace. Uh, I decided to refresh. Uh, I want to be real clear on the old Boomar monks. And uh, Ken, this is how they are described uh, in the Canon tab of Wikipedia. Bomar monks was a religious order that believed in isolating themselves from all physical sensation to enhance the power of their minds. To that aim, enlightened monks had their brains transplanted into nutrient-filled jars. Whenever they wanted to move, those bottled brains <laughs> used spider-like droid walkers. <laughs> and a little bit later, it says, Jabba allowed the monks to still roam around his appropriated palace as he enjoyed the gruesome sight of them. <laughs> and that is from the Star Wars character encyclopedia. <laughs> uh, and also, of course, the uh, the backstory that uh, Jabba's palace and uh, one of the locations that we see in the film of the Clone Wars animated series uh, on Teth are Bomar monk monasteries that have been taken over by various uh, crime lords and bounty hunters and mm. smugglers and all that. So how did you feel about seeing the Bomar monk? For you, was it just like, cool, uh, the thing that was in the background in Return of the Jedi is now in the foreground, or did it have any more meaning? Um, I love, number one, I loved it. I loved it. Uh, what I'm thinking about is, it was, I, I, I was laughing because this is the kind of Star Wars fan we all are, right? Um, about two days ago, I was just sitting at home and it just went like this. I wonder when we're going to see that Bomar monk we saw in the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> right it's nothing to do with anything right or you know maybe it does but like i just had the moment so then when it happened uh, you know sitting uh, next to grace and i always always say this my, my partner uh, grace huge star wars fan uh, just not not invested in it on a daily sometimes minute level like i am um she uh hates spiders i can't i cannot stress she's the biggest <laughs> Lord of the rings fan in the world she will not watch a lot of the she loves stuff uh hates spiders and so when that popped up she had quite a reaction to it and then i instead of being comforting and uh hearing and meeting her at her level of pain and uncomfort uh <laughs> uncomfortable level i went like this uh, well honey uh, those are the bomar monks from return of the jedi you see one <laughs> with the uh, that's not the right play by the way anybody um <laughs> yeah it's funny to imagine comforting somebody who deeply doesn't like spiders to be like it's okay they're not spiders they're robot spiders carrying around their own brains in a jar yeah, that's yeah. less creepy right yeah, then it makes it worse in, in, that, in that in that container is a brain of a monk that <laughs> just like oh stop, stop, stop. <laughs> not helping <laughs> i don't want to think of a spider with a monk brain on it like no 
Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, other than that, no, uh, I, 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 I just loved it uh, on that level too. So yeah, it was great. Great to see. Yeah. I think for me, I've just, I've been so excited since I saw them in that teaser because I just really feel like that's a little bit of what the Mandalorian and book of Boba Fett storytelling is about is, Hey, we saw these things for just a split second. What if we spent more time with them? Uh, what if we took the things that were literally in the background or literally on the side of the screen and put them front and center in the light foreground? And for me, just kind of physically, the Bomar Monk represents that. And I don't think that the episode was trying to tie into any of their actual backstory and make you think about it. But right. then when I looked it up on on Wikipedia for just like making sure I got my Star Wars facts right, it was such a great reminder that it actually does tie into some of the <laughs> themes of this series and episode that, yeah, that's an appropriated palace. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that uh, these monks are still scuttling around, uh, still kind of being allowed to be a part of a place that used to be theirs yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it actually does have uh, if you dive into it it does actually have some <laughs> rhythms you know which is one of the gifts of star wars being such a vast uh, mm. uh tapestry of storytelling well a vast tapestry of storytelling that is sometimes boiled down to the simplest of themes I, I think that's why i love it so much and continue to get so much from it you can't those connections are there those connections are there so i love it and by the way the headcanon conversation of like boba fett takes over and like some of the monks are there and he's like hey pete good to see you again <laughs> you, you, you hang around here it's yours anyways hang around Right. I, I imagine that that is just a fun shot, but I can absolutely see Boba going like, I've discovered they used to own this place. Uh, bring them in. Yeah, bring them in. Bring <laughs> Give them in. some of this food. We got too much. Ah, yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we talked a little bit about the uh, great story of how everything was divided by these three families that uh, Bib Fortuna brought in to help uh, firm up his hold and his claim to Jabba's territory. Uh, the specific line is the Trandoshans took the city center, the Aqualish, the workers district here, and the Clantuinians, the starport in Upper Sprawl. That's all cool. That's It's amazing to hear the word Aqualish out loud on yeah. live television yeah. or live action television. Uh, but what I wanted to ask for this uh, canon notice is, are you concerned at all about how this version of Mos Espa fits with a uh, uh, Phantom Menace? Uh, you know, are you looking at this and going like, okay, where did Anakin and Shmi live? Where's Watto's shop? <laughs> How I, do you feel about those discussions? I did. I've, I've had that a few times and I've seen that come up online and, and Hey, we, you know, we just didn't see a ton of the city and it looks like we're kind of a, we're on the surface right there. And, uh, and, and those scenes, uh, and even when, uh, you know, Anakin flies back to it. So yeah, no, a couple of times it's popped up, but you know, I, I, I'm always excited to learn about, uh, you know, Jabba had a second garage. You're going to learn about it. Like, uh, <laughs> I'm cool with it. But yeah, it, it oddly enough, I've thought about it a couple times. Yeah, I think uh, for me, I just always like storytelling or design like this that like don't let the past limit your exploration of the future. And since Mos Espa, you know, it, it's not just like a cool place that a character pops into as we see in this chapter. It's like the people who live there matter, how the city functions matters. So I love that it's this uh, much more elaborate, intriguing design. And for me, like, it's kind of, I got my canon answer here of like, okay, the stuff that I saw in the prequels, uh, that mostly took place in the starport in the upper sprawl. Great. Now when they walk into town, I'll be like, ah, cool. They're walking into the upper sprawl. Yeah. Yeah. I would love a shot. I know it's probably not close to the city center, but like, uh, I would love a, and here's the pod race uh, arena that we used to run every, like, give me one of those shots. Give me that. Give me that. Oh yeah. 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 Let's see exactly where that is. Uh, any other thoughts on that? No, no. Uh, other than, uh, you know me, I love my maps. So I, I did watch that scene a few times. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Uh, I, we have to call out a direct quote uh, from a watermonger to Obi-Wan Kenobi. I don't think he knew, uh, but talking about the the street gang, uh, the Lorth Appeal says they are half man, half machine. They modify their bodies with droid parts to make themselves even more deadly. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, how Lorth Appeal is uh, having this specific, like, the kids these days <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, with their tattoos and their piercings. Uh, yeah. They're clearly bad, right? Uh, I feel like that's going on in the context of the episode. But the specific half man, half machine, and th that the loss of any organic body part can be a stand-in for a loss of humanity, that's a discussion that's been going on uh, since the uh, original trilogy and being re-examined. In, in lots of places. How did you feel about that specific quote uh, being pulled out, which connects it to that discussion in Return of the Jedi? I think it was very effective in, in doing what you said of just like an, an older view on it. And I didn't spend a lot of time looking at it that way right away of just like, 
this is a new generation doing something. I made the joke about the Gen Z thing earlier only because just it was just such a TikTok like exchange of like, yeah, old man, I'm Boba Fett. Yeah, no, I know who you are, old man. You're, you're old it, man. Like, I get, it I was very, very okay, space boomer. Yes, it was very much that. But to see it from that and just to have, uh, again, um, you said so well, don't let, you know, the past, don't let it block uh, your, your path forward here in the future of learning more about it. Of just that's been so used so powerfully in Star Wars, the grievous uh, being a, a stand in for what Vader will become, Vader himself, Luke's hand, all those kind of things. Like, but, uh, you know, I'm sure there's from some people out there who are like, hey, this this eye has kept me alive. Fennec Shan's probably like, oh, yeah, I, hey, you, you guys want to see mine? Like, look what I've got. Like, <laughs> and, and to kind of reclaim it and repurpose it to, for 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 a new theme. Um, it's, it's pretty powerful. I, I enjoyed that. Yeah, and to say like like in um in the Leia Princess of Aldron uh book, uh, Claudia Gray specifically had Bray Organa have an actual accident and yep. uh, have uh, I believe a, a robotic uh, heart and lungs, the pulmonodes, um to kind of push back a little bit on uh what happened in the original trilogy. And for me, I I am not bashing on the original trilogy because mm -hmm. I take it as uh, it's not that losing a physical body part uh, takes away your humanity. It's I see all that is that scars of violence, that scars of the yep. choice of violence. And when Luke is looking at his hand, it is saying like, uh, if I walk down this path, um, I, I will take on all of these emotional scars. And this is a physical representation of it. Not like there is something that you lose your humanity if you have an injured organ that's replaced. Or if you, yep. in this case, if you choose to say, Hey, I, I want, I, I have agency and I want this to be a part of my body. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the grievous having the theme of, of unlimited power and, and sacrificing everything about yourself um, to supposedly make yourself better. And you're a hacking coughing, uh, you know, a uh, coward, <laughs> you know, that's a yeah. different theme and different use of it. Yeah. I agree with you. Claudia Gray, I don't think was uh, fighting against it. It was just based off, uh, I mean, you and I are discovered based off the, the actual actor who played Brea or who had a, a similar real world kind of a situation going on in that to use it to, to redefine someone in a new light is, is, is a well, well use of that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I thought that was powerful and cool to keep this uh, conversation going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of keep, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, it's a good use. I think I said well use, which is a, that's a, I think that's a medicine. No, uh, <laughs> use. uh, I also wanted to ask you about this. Uh, there's that uh, moment where Boba Fett does connect with the uh, street gang. And he says uh, to Drash, you better fight as good as you talk dank. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> How does this change our understanding of the curse dank ferric? Uh, look, I I don't, yeah, I love it. I want a shirt and now someone's going to post a shirt and take it and, and make more money than I ever would off of it. But I want a shirt that just says, I talk dank. <laughs> I, I want to see, you know, Tamora Morrison in his great uh, no BS Boba Fett grumble say, I don't like dank memes. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Brian Ward, get on that shirt right now. Get in there. Get in there fast. You better fight as good as you talk dank. Yeah, I think that one might get spread around the old internet. Yeah. Uh, very fun. And uh, Dank Ferrick was, again, used in this episode, and I like those things that make it feel a little bit more like, oh, we could mm. start to maybe piece together <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what these words might be standing in for in Star mm. Wars land. Uh, this is just a, a noticing the, the fun uh, wildlife of Tatooine. A uh, womp rat and a bird that I could not identify uh, being eaten by a wart. Uh, the cycle of life followed by a burp. Uh, Return of the Jedi, uh, holding the crown for, I believe, most burps in a Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. uh, how did you feel about uh, the, uh, was this was this a, a, a burp of nostalgia? <laughs> too much nostalgia in this burp? Yeah. Yeah, clearly Star Wars just a wash and too much nostalgia. I loved it. Uh, as Qui Gon Jinn once said, "There's always a bigger wart," and uh, I love that. <laughs> I love that little beat. Yeah, it is a fun beat uh, for me. I I enjoyed it. So we, we don't need to spend any more time on that old cycle of life. There, uh, you mentioned this. There was these great uh, Mos Eisley and Mandalorian or Mandoverse connections. Where in the uh, flashback, of Boba Fett uh, does go to Mos Eisley. Uh, he sees these stormtrooper helmets being placed on the uh, pikes, uh, <laughs> not the species, the pikes, I'll yeah. say spikes, uh, stormtrooper helmets being placed on the spikes uh, that we saw in the Mandalorian. Uh, we see Pelimoto and the pit droids march by. Uh, first, I just want to ask you about this. How do you feel like we're running down some of these like, oh, this connects to this film from 1983. Uh, this is uh, Favreau and team referencing their own show from <laughs> two years ago. How do you feel about that? 
I, I I really love it. Like I said, up top, I really, I, you know, Grace will tell you, I, I kind of popped up and went, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it's Pelly. She was like, oh, I go, Pelly, Pelly, Amy Sedaris with the pit, pit, pit droids. Oh, yeah, 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 right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just kind of fun. And I, I've spent many minutes on our podcast going, I don't know. I don't know about Pelly. I don't know about the tone. And and I can still have those thoughts, but this is how Star Wars works. When you're really in it, man, uh, you just start to love it. And, and it was good use of it. It was a fun wink and a nod. Um, but also to remind you that all this is going on. All of it is happening. Yeah, I think I really liked it as just uh, centering us in most Eisley. Um, obviously, Boba Fett literally says it, but, you know, having that sense of connection. And I thought there was a sense of timeline, right? It wasn't just that the helmets uh, were on the spikes. It's mm-hmm. that they were being placed there. And Boba kind of gives him a look. Is that Boba going like, oh, wow, yeah, I should check the hollow news. Did the Empire fall? A hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. I know there has been... Um some discussion uh, out there I saw last week of like, are we going to, you know, remember Cobb Vanth and everyone watched it happen at the bar, this destruction of the second Death Star uh, over there in Freetown there, uh, uh, Mos Pelgo. So um, we're going to see that. And obviously it looks like we're not going to see it. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's a, 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 an early celebration on behalf of Mos Eisley. But uh, I, I, I would love uh, uh, Boba running to the newspaper. Give me, give me the galaxy today. What's happening? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of took it as like, oh no, the the party already happened. It looks like there's a little bit of rubble in Mos Eisley, like that mm-hmm. they, you know, that the people of Mos Eisley cleared out the Imperial remnant there. Yeah, and that's how them spikes ended up. Uh, those helmets on them, spikes. Uh, yeah, I kind of like it. It's just a nod uh, that just look of Boba Fett and <laughs> going like, oh yeah, check the news, Boba. Yeah. Um, so we talked a lot about this new Rancor Keeper. But I did want to ask you in terms of canon and lore connections, um, does, does this this emotion, this connection, which has been in in books, uh, does this add to the trauma of Malakili and Patissa, their relationship in the scene in Return of the Jedi that, you know, I think back in 83 was kind of intended as a joke. And then yeah. a lot of us took it to heart and were sad. Uh, yeah, yeah. And a lot of things in Star Wars sometimes seem as little one off uh, bits or jokes or, or, or over just even overlooked, uh, you know, story opportunities. Uh we always go to the big one about Leia, Alderaan, it blew up, but here's your blanket, Luke. It's a big one to, to define Leia going forward. So uh, it absolutely makes, it adds to the Malachi story. You and I have been talking about Malachi Keeley a few times, and I love the use of him in the aftermath um, interlude. So yeah, no, I'm going to watch that scene, and now, now I'm definitely, flashback to 1983, I'm screaming in the theater, going, no, 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 the space monster's going to get me. Uh, to now I'm going to be crying with Malachi. Yeah, no, that's it's we we did talk about it recently on that companion episode. Um, in that that beat in Return of the Jedi has always uh, I've always felt bad for Malakili and for the humanity that that truly confers upon uh the Rancor. Uh, and now I'm gonna feel it even more <laughs> thanks yep. to this chapter of Book of Boba Fett. Yep. Uh, another great lore mention of just uh, uh the Rancor people saying it is said that the witches of Dathomir even rode them, meaning Rancors, through the forest and fan. Mm. Uh, I just loved hearing the witches of Dathomir on live action television as well. How, how did you feel? Yeah, I know uh, a lot of people, uh, we got shades of courtship of princess Leia, right? A lot of people excited about that, uh, today. Uh, loved it. Um, and I've been, um, uh, you know, uh, trying to get uh, Grace to sit down and watch a lot of the Clone Wars, uh, Night Sister stuff. So mm. I think now I finally got her pulled in. She was, she little, she was like, witches. Did she, he say witches? Like, the witches of Dathomir, <laughs> honey. Yes. Yes. Let me Tell you about witches in Star Wars, the yeah. Night Sisters of Dathomir. So great, so yeah. great. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I like it when Boba Fett uh, says he wants to ride that rancor, and he says I've ridden beasts ten times its size. So my story, or my question for you, Ken, mm-hmm. is uh, is the story of the faithful Wookiee, the uh, cartoon where Boba Fett made his premiere, is that now canon since we saw him <laughs> ride a massive beast? Hundred percent canon. Hundred percent canon. <laughs> Uh, and I do contend, if you guys have not watched The Faithful Wookiee, the animated part for the Star Wars Holiday Special, uh, watch it now after watching Mando and even now Book of Boba Fett. Watch it. And you tell me Favreau didn't look at that and go, can we just make these an entire series? <laughs> There's so much going on. Uh, the evolution of explosion from that uh, that one short cartoon early early in the lore and canon of Star Wars. Yeah. How did you take I've Ridden Beast 10 times its size? Did your mind go anywhere else? Uh, no, we went to the Faithful Wookiee there and maybe things we have not seen. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I can't wait to see that. Uh, the full Ronto carcass from the larder. I liked hearing that just because of Ronto, but it's also like uh, this, this rancor is, is like it's eating at Galaxy's Edge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got a ticket. Uh, and uh, I have not yet uh, spent a lot of time diving into uh, reactions. I'm very curious if people are going to have a reaction to this. In that uh, chase with the Major Domo in the Most Vespa gang, 
uh, there is what looks like kind of a, <laughs> maybe a black velvet painting of Jabba's entourage, including Boba Fett himself on that image that then gets smashed through in classic uh, chase uh, mm. format. How did you feel about that image being in universe? Uh, I enjoyed it. I, I, I'm going to, I haven't done the pause on it yet. Cause I want to see who who's all uh, up there. Uh, and how they captured Sally B. I want to see that, but uh, I like it. And 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 yeah, obviously the reference we're talking about probably more what's a reference to, but uh, in, in terms of spirit, just seeing it there and uh, who, how did they pose for the picture? There's a lot of questions to have. Is my point. Yeah, I believe it is old concept art because mm-hmm. when I am finished watching Book of Boba Fett, it brings up the screen for that Boba Fett uh, retrospective under the helmet, right? And the image that is on the screen. Uh, in, in that iteration uh, of looking at the under the helmet documentary is that image except for Luke is there in the, the original image and mm. Luke has been removed in this painting that's being carried through the streets of Mos Espa. That's great. I'm going to look close, more closely at that then. Yeah. So it's an interesting thing of like, they're carrying what appears to be star Wars concept art through star Wars. <laughs> and for me, it's a little <laughs> bit like that discussion of hearing the upbeat version of the Imperial March right. in the recruitment center on Solo, mm-hmm. um, that it, it definitely has an element of cheek. But for me, it works that this uh, story is Jabba had a real presence and maybe somebody even had like one of the, one of Jabba's vassals even had a painting to like soothe uh, his ego when, yeah. <laughs> when Jabba's people came by. And, but now they're getting around to like, eh, I think we can finally get rid of that. <laughs> you know, it's like a, it's a, you know, you can get a four center poster if you'd like uh, you, you, if you're a subscriber to Java, you got the port, you got the poster. Yeah, exactly. That, that was a, <laughs> a Patreon bonus uh, for Java's top tier vassals, I guess. Yeah. Um, so it didn't bother you. It wasn't uh, like this is the real world intruding on the the fantasy world of Star Wars. No, but again, I mean, I'm going to take a closer look at it just in terms of the art itself. And I love, I love any time McCoy stuff is, is referenced. It seems to be one of Filoni's favorite hobbies, by the way, and which is a great hobby to have. I just was so focused on, you know, the chase of it all in that moment. Um, um, so I'll, I'm going to revisit that. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, just uh, two more things. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of different uh, known characters who pop up, so we don't, or, or species, so we don't uh, stop and uh, reference all of them. But I did really love seeing the Rick series, uh, General Labor Droid, which is the uh, the droid that uh, uh, takes people around on rickshaws. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, like uh, took Padme and Anakin, and now taking Biths for a ride. How did you feel about that? I it was actually a missed opportunity. This is why the episode is the worst ever Boba Fett episode ever. It it, it should have said okie okie and like done that little thing but <laughs> that situation was not okie okie no right? it was not it was not maybe they should have screamed uh something else <laughs> dank dank <laughs> dank dank uh final thing for me uh i really felt like the fruits that uh the major domo ultimately crashed into uh, looked familiar and uh, from my googling they do appear to be uh the melaroon fruit that uh, hera likes in rebels right yeah yeah absolutely good yeah. weird looking star wars fruit Yep, nice, weird-looking Star Wars fruit. That's everything I have for canon and lore connections. Anything else jump out to you? Uh, no, no, no. That was uh, that was uh, about it for me. I always, uh, I know the a lot of pressure on you to compile this list, and I'm trying to be better at the canon list more than anything. But uh, no, I loved <laughs> it all there. Yeah, and as always, we recommend the Star Wars Explained videos that uh, find absolutely everything, uh, in in my estimation, mm-hmm. always great. So check those out. They do for every chapter of Book of Boba Fett, all those uh, canon cool. connections. Great, uh, no, great, talk- great point, Joseph. We, I can't, Alex and Molly should put out the video. What is dank? <laughs> what is dank? <laughs> what is dank? <laughs> what is dank? Absolutely, I would love to see that. Uh, let's talk action. There were really two big action scenes. So, uh, did you have some favorite action moments from the action scenes? Yeah, I just wrote down this sentence: Crescent, just good old angry fighting black Crescent. Uh, <laughs> really loved it. And uh, <laughs> shout out, good to, old traditional. Yeah, yeah. I want to. Uh, Carrie Jones is uh, the performer's name. Who is uh, actually he's done he's done some acting, but he's most known actually for, as a makeup artist. Uh, and I'm fascinated by Favreau kind of grabbing people and uh, stunt performers and, and whatnot. And, and, and um, that bartender and, and uh, uh, Tossy Station was like a stunt coordinator and a performer over the years. But now this is a great makeup artist who is actually uh, an Emmy Award winner. Gets to uh, He's 6'7", so he gets to be Christian. Wow. 
And, you know, a lot of people were talking about, uh, myself included, about the eyes, the eyes of Chrisanne in that scene and that meme that has gone around the world. That's Those are his eyes, man. So <laughs> shout out to you, Kerry Jones. Really loved uh, all the action here. And I know, you know, stunt performance and whatnot, but hey, he's 6'7". He was probably getting at it and I loved it. Yeah, I know. He, he did some good glaring and some good throwing. Yeah, I mean, I was just really affected by just the reality of seeing a live action, huge Wookiee fight, right? Like we've yeah. seen Chewbacca on screen. Uh, you know, absolutely. He rips some arms off in solo, <laughs> right. but ever since 1977, there's the buildup of like, you do not want to cross a Wookiee in full rage and to, you know, really see one full live action was really amazing. So the, the fight in general is just like a, a sit back and appreciate what you got. Um, yeah. But for me, for specific moments, I really loved uh, Boba Fett, you know, almost getting some of his armor tech, his Mandalorian tech, ending up with a gaffy stick. <laughs> the, mm -hmm. He was not winning that fight, but the horrible uh, viciousness of burying it in the back and then mm. retrieving it later. Mm. Mm. No. Nope. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Not a favorite moment for you? <laughs> I just, I just painful, you know. I just, you, you know, I just, uh, it, uh, one of those things. No, I love that. I, I love that. I love things. No, it was great use. And, and uh, you know, again, Boba Fett, Boba Fett's good at fighting, right? He's a little old, a little worse for wear. Again, this is literally what I look like getting up every morning, uh, falling out of bed, fighting myself <laughs> as uh, my back uh, says, nope. Um, but no, I, I love, I love uh, what you're saying there, but it just was so visceral, so visceral. Yeah. The other big moment from that fight that I really liked, all the beats were great, but that the Gamorrean tackle to see a, a furious Wookiee, tackle two Gamorreans and roll down stairs. That is definitely in the like, would have made my head explode if you told me as a kid, you're going to see an angry, mean Wookiee yeah. <laughs> tackle two Gamorreans in Jabba's palace. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of uh, pro wrestling, it was this double spear on the Gamorreans and it was just set up so nicely. It paid off. It was the beat. It was the pain. It was the look, yeah, <laughs> everything about it, the thud. Uh, it's, uh, it's worth a replay. Absolutely. And uh, uh, this isn't really an action beat, but I really did also love in terms of uh, uh, Boba Fett's empathy, mercy, connection. Uh, those Gamorreans, the way he's just like, yeah, no, that one got a chunk bit out of him. Take him to my back to pod. Yeah. No, again, respect all the way down. Boba Fett knows respect how to do Respect all the way down. Yeah. Mm. Uh, any other thoughts on the Wookiee fight before we move on to the chase? I wanted to shout out Fennec for just pulling the trap door, you know, don't work harder, work smarter. And uh, that solved the problem. She was great. Love that. Yeah, that was so great. And the precision throw, of course, of her, her little, oh, yeah, uh, by the way, her little knife. There. Yeah, I'm loving that little knife coming out of the the, the butt of the gun there. That, that's been, uh, she used that very well. Love that. Yeah, an ace up her sleeve, a knife up her. <laughs> I'm not going to finish that. That uh, came out wrong. Anyway, let's move on to the chase. Uh, you sound like you had some conflicted feelings about the chase. Uh, if, if, yeah, yeah, no, conf conflicted uh, in the sense of, I'll start with it with a positive. Uh, this ends up being more like a, uh, a lot of people saying Back to the Future too, but I'm also say Pee Wee's some Pee Wee's Big Adventure energy, some Wayne's World Two energy, which uh, that that Wayne's World Two chase has a lot of. Well, why is that playing a class there? And it's just fun. <laughs> and so I think this this chase becomes more of an homage to great movie chase tropes than anything, though it's effectively used in the story. David Pesquese does such a good job. His comedy is so good that I, on the second view, and I really appreciated all his facial reactions. So I understand it might cut undercut what the, the perceived. Um, tension or whatever you might want to say about a, a chase scene. The other side of it is, and it harkens back to a little bit of my uh, thoughts about Mando season one, when you shoot in the volume and, you, and, and you know, it's, it's star Wars TV. And again, last night, I just watched solo last night, we were leading up to Mando and watching the chase, the opening chase out of Coronet city. And man, it's, it's a, such a big movie, right? It's just a big thing. And yeah, I know there's stunt trucks being driven, but it's like, you see it on a big screen and it's giant and it's Star Wars and it's real. This one plays a little different. It's kind of a slow speed chase through the city, by the way. Uh, you got Vespa's going about 30 miles an hour and a, and, and a major domo, probably not a great stunt driver. Um, so I can get behind that. So I think those two things combined of like, this is definitely some humor. It's things I'm familiar with in other movies, both uh, the old days when they did for real and Wayne's World 2 commenting on it. And then it had more, more comedy than I would have thought in a chase, but it doesn't mean I didn't like it. It doesn't mean I didn't think there was great things in it. It just, uh, I had to come around to how it was playing, whether or not they fully intended it that way, by the way, I don't know, but how it played to me uh, was uh, at odds with how I maybe thought it would have gone. 
Yeah, I think for me, it definitely had an element of comedy, partially just because that is who the major Domo character is, that that the point of him is being made through comedy, that he represents mm-hmm. uh, the that strength, a kind of strength that comes from uh, red tape and do you know the correct word and did you fill out the report correctly? Do you have an appointment? And then to see that character sort of flung into like, well, here's a different definition of strength, of actual just uh, physical prowess and violence and you know that's what fennec's doing is cutting through it of like yeah no you can you can boss most people around here in the most espa uh, you know government dmv center with that kind of power but i have a blaster and i'll open a hole in your heart you know yeah and i feel like for me then the chase had a little bit of a combination of it had some like fun thrilling moments to me but it had some comedy that did just kind of echo out from who that major domo character is yeah, no, I, I actually really, agree. again, especially second view, we always talk about second viewings in Star Wars are pretty darn valuable. I really enjoy, just enjoy him as a performer. So I, I just seen it and, and it's all there. And his, uh, <laughs> again, there's this recurrent theme of appointments. It's like I'm trying to book with Kaiser here. This all these episodes. <laughs> did you want the appointment? Oh, let's see if I can mess around with the appointments. So I think it all, all did really work for me. Because again, yeah, you're right. It wasn't, they're not chasing Chris Atten. I would expect that chase to go a lot different if Black or Santin is driving uh, something there and they're chasing him. It is this, uh, you know, this middle manager trying to get away from his uh, responsibilities uh, and, uh, and take the moral low ground, I guess. So it, it worked from that regard as well. And it's just, sorry, you know, we, we are such a um, understandably pop culture driven uh, society and, and, uh, and, and this punditry and everything. Like it's very hard not to watch something like that and think, Oh, that's like back to the future too. And that, is probably true in some way and it's not a bad thing, but then you, I, I think sometimes you have to move, push past that a little bit. I, 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 there's another example of some stuff that's happened in Star Wars. I can't remember, but it's like, Oh, that's that. And it's like, well, it's not necessarily that it's just, we've seen that other thing so many times in pop culture. You can't help but think of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I totally understand uh, some of those perspectives that you kind of got to push past those immediate pop culture reactions if you kind of want to dive into a little bit more like, well, well, what's at stake in, in this version of that chase, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, you, we can see the similarities. But for me, like, I think it's it's about the major domo. It's about those crowded, uh, you know, Tatooine, Mos Espa streets. Um, I don't, for me, it isn't quite the Wayne's World joke of like, why is there suddenly a plate of glass there? It's like, it's, uh, I think I had a visceral reaction because it's not uh, most Espa. I believe it's supposed to be most Eisley in the you know most recent Battlefront game. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have uh, one of the most Vespa gang, you know, trips over a chair. I've gotten stuck in the chairs on the street <laughs> <laughs> in that video game again and again. I've, yeah. you know, I've tried to have a land speeder in there and I have rammed into things, into <laughs> annoying obstacles. I've been swearing at my television. I've been the major domo. So for me, I felt like, Finally, yeah. Look, <laughs> I'm not alone. That they, was my cultural touch point. Yeah, if anyone's watched me play Red Dead Redemption online when I Twitch stream it, I've gotten so many uh, horse carriages stuck in trees when I've lost control. <laughs> so I feel you. Yeah, and again, like the Wayne's World 2 thing to me, it's like I love I love the Wayne's World movies and then I can't help but think that, but I don't necessarily think Favreau and Rodriguez were like, hey, you know that Wayne's World 2 joke they make about this thing? Let's, yeah, yeah, but it's like it's like I, it's like it's so part of me. Uh, and that's just sometimes maybe uh, these scenes can fall victim to that. Yeah. And I think you, like for me, I could look at it a couple of ways. I could look at it as like, okay, I wanted, you know, the, the Wookiee fight was a big explosion of action. Um, mm-hmm. The, the Christanton fight. And I want another like big, serious, wow, amazing action fight. I want Mandalorian taking down, uh, you know, the new Republic prison droids. Uh, I want Boba Fett, you know, fighting the stormtroopers on Tython. Like, I just don't think that's what this is. Yeah. I feel like what this was about is uh, Fennec could have kicked one of those kids off and taken the speeder and she would have, and it would have been a more vicious fight. You know, Boba Fett probably could have, uh, he rocketed to the conclusion. He probably could have taken care of it himself. Yep. For me, this chase is about like, hey, uh, kids, you say you want to be involved. Uh, here's one of the a-holes who's <laughs> high in power mm-hmm. who could have been helping you who isn't. Like, I mean, when you think about that of like, hey, uh, disenfranchised uh, uh, punk kids Mm-hmm. who are being told you're no good by the establishment, but the establishment won't help you at all. The mayor's assistant is running away. You want to take your little hot rods and teach them a bleeping <laughs> lesson? That's what that is. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and you said something too. I really love it. It's just you're coming out of this pretty vicious fight with Chrysanne, which by the way, 
uh, talk about pop culture and references. Like I, Chris Santon uh, screaming and everyone's around him d- reminded me of Lithgow stumbling onto Harry uh, and Harry and the Hendersons in the kitchen. <laughs> all right, so it, it, it's all it's all relative, I guess. But you know that that was a pretty realistic, uh, brutal Star Wars fight that you're probably like, yeah, 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 more of that. And you're right, the next big sequence plays a lot differently, and it, you're going to weigh one against the other naturally. And and again, we 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 push towards this idea of engage with what's there in that chase and that scene for you. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, there were a couple of cool moments. I think like, I don't think there's anything cool going on with the major domo. He's, he's not a mover and shaker. He's not an expert uh, driver, but I loved actually seeing their uh, chosen droid parts in action. Um, Mm -hmm. The, uh, the pumping knife foot. Yeah. The pumping (laughs) knife foot was awesome. (laughs) I I got no problem with the pumping knife foot. And I really did like uh, Drash, you know, using the environment, her knowledge of the streets Mm -hmm. to just fly up and, crash into him that was great i love that and then uh what is now to me already an iconic shot of the the peeling up toward the camera and knowing that that was after she took out this right. this figure of authority the uh, who's actually a coward uh, yeah. great i loved it yeah no there's a great shot too when the camera's uh looking on on up and drash kind of has that look down and it's uh it's a uh, very sly knowing i'm gonna i'm gonna get you smile and it was a great little moment yeah Absolutely loved it. Absolutely. Uh, any other thoughts on the action before we move on to the comedy? Uh, that was the comedy. Hey, ho. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'm good. All right. I'm going to try to edit myself a little bit because I wrote down a lot of lines. I think that there were some good, uh, like, actual jokes and then just some things that I was just, like, utterly charmed by because there's this great charm to me that's really emerging from Boba Fett of he is a serious, dangerous person. Mm-hmm. Uh but then, so then when he does talk about kind of day-to-day things, it's really charming and really uh, not funny in a way that, that lessens him, uh, funny in a way that is uh, intriguing because these different parts of this human are coming out. I agree with you. There, there was a lot of comedy, but I, we always, comedy, whim, whimsy, or weirdness is this category, and a lot of charming whimsy in this. Yeah. So where do you go? W- what jumped out to you? I'm going to say it again, but and, 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 you know, bear with me all. I just love, does he have an appointment? Fennec asked that about first Lorth Appeal. And then on the other hand, she's like, do you want the appointment or not? Just a lot of appointment talk that I'm here for because I love that kind of uh, office comedy, I guess. Well, and I love that Boba Fett's not here for it, right? Yeah, I, no. To me, that is one of the big themes gotten through. Of, like Boba Fett hates all the, the lies and the red tape and the backstabbing. Mm-hmm. He just wants to be direct. So like, yeah, no, you don't need an appointment to see me. <laughs> Come on in. Go ahead. Love that. Uh, so the actual line, we've been paraphrasing Lorth Appeal a lot, but to hear Stephen Root in Star Wars say, a street gang of insolent youths. <laughs> For me, it was the, and I am insulted on your behalf. Yeah. <laughs> so great. So yeah. Great. Absolutely great. Um, another early one for me, a lot of the stuff that 88 uh, said in the way they say it is uh, funny, I think, because uh, uh, this comedy that's coming from the character of 88 is so immersed in this world and so wants to be respectful uh, to Boba Fett. But I particularly loved, after living with it since 1983, to hear 88 describe the events of Return of the Jedi as after the sail barge disaster. Uh. Uh, it just it had some that that uh, <laughs> phrasing had some english on it that that was 88's opinion of like if you asked him uh, yeah. he could tell you everyone who is responsible for that absolute cock up yes absolutely i love that moment that's hilarious yeah what are some others for you uh i love this moment i love this moment uh where uh in, in talking to lord appeal he's a water monger and and it's so we've been talking about in terms of the thieves right the water theme around boba fett but i love outside of these big important themes that boba fett just goes i grew up surrounded by water like he's dad fat where you're like we know you went to penn state dad we know we know it yeah, and I like that they're going to they're going to engage on a real who knows the most about the, you know, uh, environmental history yeah. 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 <laughs> of Tatooine. It's like it's interesting actually. They, it was uh, once covered by oceans. It's interesting and they get interrupted before they have a real dad conversation about who knows the most about, you know, the different levels of uh, soil in Tatooine's history. Yeah, look, and we all do it. Grace tells me I do it a lot. It's like, you know, I'll be like, "Oh, I'll see a commercial. Oh, I was I was uh, trained in the groundlings with them." She's like, "I know." You've told me that 50 times. 
<laughs> it happens to us all. Uh, another just Boba Fett line that I like that is just, it's just a great direct line. There's something about uh, Tamura's uh, delivery that I really enjoy. It's when he's pushing back at Lorth Appeal and goes, then farm your own water. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great conversation. It's, it just sounds, it, it absolutely makes perfect sense in the context. It, it resonates with the, the themes of the importance of water, but it also just feels like one of those insults that you could take out of it, of just like mm. <laughs> saying to somebody in real life, go farm your own water. <laughs> Love that. Uh, yeah. The look old man. That was great. You mm-hmm. highlighted that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I went back and did the math again. You know, Boba Fett's had a rough life. He's in his early 40s. <laughs> oh, yeah, wow. My Star Wars math holds, you know. Hey, look, there's some aging going on, especially on Tatooine. That that actually really holds well in <laughs> Star Wars. Real, real life, he's 61, right? It's shot yeah. probably around 59, 60, but uh, age, age is just a number uh, in both ways, I guess, in Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how about more for you? I love, so in that, uh, after he uh, it gives... Um, Lortha Pill, the, the 500 credits instead of the 1500 he says he's owed. He, he says something about moving to Moss Eisley. Fennec has the greatest laugh on that joke. Like it's some like, it, it's an insult on Moss Eisley. So I don't want to insult a city, but it's like, yeah, well, we, whatever, move to Detroit. <laughs> yeah, <whatever. laughs> like it's just, it's, I just, it's, I've watched it a couple of times. Like she really, she really reacts to that. What's, you know, what's the view? Moss asked about a Moss Eisley. Is there, there's some kind of Gungan Naboo stuff going on there when you talk about? Well, you know, I grew up in the, uh, mostly in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, right next to each other. And there are so many Minneapolis, St. Paul jokes. The towns do have different histories and different vibes. Uh, and I can see like somebody, if somebody's trying to be, you know, big time, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, a city, a city person, uh, you know, a city government person in Minneapolis, you know, that would be a loaded thing to go like, well, then I guess you can move to St. Paul. <laughs> Move to Moss Eisley. They got one stoplight. Have we discovered the uh, Springfield versus Shelbyville of the Star Wars galaxy? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's just, I, I think there's also just like Fennec, just she, you know, she believes in Boba Fett and herself, right? And yeah. she just doesn't want to take anywhere near as much BS as she feels like Boba Fett's taken. So it just feels like she's like, yeah, get him. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> love Flame his ass with your words, if not your actual flamethrower. I uh, love that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I really liked the, um, I liked the, uh, this kind of whimsy and weirdness, but I liked Boba Fett at, at the buffet going enough food. <laughs> yeah. And just that whole idea of like Boba Fett is not interested in the kind of selfish trappings of being the head of the family. And, you know, it's great when Fang's like, enjoy it a little bit. And that's just not where his mind's at. And yeah. I just, it's fun for me, uh, to hear, you know, uh, again, seeing Boba Fett as kind of a, a real human going, look, yeah. I, I don't need eighths, you know, <laughs> the table's full droid. And look, I, I, I make, I make this joke a lot because I really love the show uh, that I'm referencing a lot, but uh, the shots, just the shots of the food and then the dessert trays table, like the, there's a dessert display behind them at the table. <laughs> I count this as one of Favreau's cooking shows. Like Roy Choi's around the corner. Robert Rodriguez is probably there making pizzas for Guillermo del Toro like you talked about in his episode of, of The Chef Show. It, it, I just love it. I just love these. Gi- they took some time to show you every dish on the table. Yeah, it was really great. Absolutely great. Uh, I have just a few more. What do you got? Uh, last one. Uh, some of them we talked about the heavy handed joke and everything. Uh, a com- complete whimsy for me and, and charming and just heart, our, our heart string pulling uh when uh, Rancor Keeper uh, Danny Trejo says, don't worry, he'll be back. Man, that just made me so happy and also sad. You know, I got to say that to Baxter when Grace leaves. Don't worry, mommy will be back. I just such a, a pet loving moment and a sweet moment. Yeah. Uh, and for me, all the other moments were in that Rancor area. So many great ones. Uh, the, just the absolute intensity of Boba Fett just turning and going, I want to ride it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, not a scripted joke it's serious and it will have implications i believe yeah. but I, just, I love that intensity i want to write it well there's already you know we had the like a bantha meme and gif going around last week right i think we're gonna i think we need the uh the i think he likes that like uh, whatever the line is i think that one that one needs to go around the internet yeah like i think that might like uh i, I always try to wait a, a little while before posting anything but you know i can see some good twitter jokes like you post a picture of those uh 12 foot home depot skeletons and then you post a picture of Bob Vett saying i want to ride it 
Uh, yeah. You mentioned it, but the, you know, is this the spot you like this? Uh, it's, uh, yeah. So charming and tender. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and final thing for me, just great visual comedy of uh, 88 uh, popping in around the Rancor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, love. Yeah. He just he, he's waiting there behind the rancor and just does a little lean into the the frame of action, which yep. is so great. Yeah, love that. And speaking of frames of action, uh, were there any directorial moments that jumped out at you? Were you like, good job, Robert Rodriguez? Um, I I think I, I don't mean to go at any kind of controversial talking point. Uh, it, you know, the the, the scene, the, the burial, uh, the 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 the. Funeral pyre, pyre of the Tuscans, uh, despite uh, all the valuable conversations they have around that. Of course, I get that. Uh, but I did love the moment to take to choose in that story to really focus on the tears of uh, Boba Fett uh, and to watch this, uh, this uh, you know, badass bounty hunter we've grown up with really feel that pain. Uh, I'm not going to say it clears away anything about that scene uh, if it uh, sets uh, uh, people watch it, but there's just something about it I liked. It was real intimate and quiet and uh, I, I enjoyed that particular shot yeah it, it was a good shot and yeah in terms of just em- embracing the story as it is um mm. with all of its uh, uh problems that need to be discussed as well uh that that shot in the emotional impact on boba fett is really powerful yeah um yeah i i really liked earlier that straight on shot of boba fett on a bantha in the tatooine suns you know and when he's yeah. he's heading out to deal with the pikes yeah and he's got this there, there's a sense of peace and purpose about him and that shot is really great it's really epic it's like a it's like old school star wars right like you got a trading card in 78 yeah this is like uh, macquarie didn't paint this one yeah <laughs> but he, he would have he would have uh, yeah yeah yeah, um, or maybe he did, and I missed that one. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I thought that was beautiful. I love seeing uh, uh, Mos Espa at night because we've seen all of those great jaw dropping to me, uh, uh, Mos Espa establishing shots. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's one of the things my wife reacted to is like, wow, at just like th- the sight of Mos Espa in that interesting, you know, topology. Uh, but to see it at night was really fun. So I like that. Yeah. Uh, and then the other, bi- other big one, I think just the way it was shot was so effective of the Rancor and Boba seeing one another of the, this. Uh, oh yeah. I like that. It kind of ties to like, we've had some different visual techniques as we've gone in and out of the, the, uh, Bacta dreams. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it kind of tied to that to see the Rancor kind of, uh, their, their vision, uh, solidify into Boba Fett. And Boba Fett was really that straight shot of him where he is projecting strength, but like his his fingers are fidgeting a little bit and he, he wants to be accepted by this rancor. He wants to connect. He is presenting himself to the rancor and the way that's shot and directed. is just beautiful. Uh, yeah, no, good, a good, good choice there. Really like that. Love that a little different, a little outside the box, right? The, the rancor's point of view. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything that we haven't uh, touched on that you wanted to talk about? Uh, running through the list here. No, it looks pretty good. We touched on a lot of things. Uh, I, I found myself more moved by this episode than I think I would have thought when it ended. Uh, because again, you're, it's so, it's so, it's so all right to process. Yeah. And, uh, we always come back to that on Force Center. It's so all right to process the good, the bad, and, uh, sometimes the ugly. And in this episode, maybe had that, had all of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think I definitely had, I enjoyed my first viewing mm-hmm. uh, very, very much, but I was also felt very aware of a lot of the, the different um, strong opinions it might elicit uh, from the Tuscans, but also lots of other elements as the show really solidifies into, yep, this is, th- those weren't just the two episodes that kind of introduced it. This, These are some of the things we're doing. We're humanizing uh, Boba Fett, you know. Mm-hmm. We are getting into the socio-political realities of Mos Espa, and even stuff that I loved, I felt I had to process a little bit, knowing that oh, well, there's, that's probably going to be discussions about that, and had to work to turn that off. Yeah, look, it, that's the way it is, and it's like, yeah, I went to bed. Uh, three thoughts was like, all right, the, the Tuscan thing is going to be uh, part of the discussion tomorrow in a lot of different ways, as it should be. Uh, that chase scene is going to uh, cause some questions and problems for a lot of folks. Maybe I've got that. Let me work through it. And then, man, that rancor scene was so good and. P.S. I want to see more Black Crescent fighting. You know, yeah, all there. And I went to bed thinking, yeah, about the rancor and the color of those bikes. There you go. <laughs> Loved it. There you Loved go. it. Uh, I, only other thing that I wanted to shout out: uh, many great actors to shout out, but I always like uh, shouting out uh, uh, Phil Lamar. He's yes. such a great, great actor with such a fascinating, varied career. I've been uh, lucky uh, to meet Phil in real life and do a couple of storytelling shows with him, and he's just a, a sweetheart. He's done so much great work in the. Clone Wars animated series. That was great to see him uh, pop up as the Pike boss in Most Eisley. Yes, and he's someone I get to say, uh, hey, when I was at the Groundlings, I got the, <laughs> yes, Ken, we know. 
We know. We know. Uh, all right. Let's move on then to any predictions or hopes for the next chapter of the Book of Boba Fett. I, I, I think last week I was like, really want to kind of get a more clearer picture of, of what he's doing in this position. And I think we did start to see that. So now I think this idea of uh, moving towards war and what that means for him in this role and what he's truly trying to accomplish um, uh, on the surface and, and, and beyond that. Uh, I'm ready for the fight. It, it looks like it's time for a fight and looks like we might get, uh, you know, maybe a, one more uh, dinner scene or two uh, coming. Sure. Got it. Take it. Is it going to be some slow, quiet conversation? Yep. Got it. I'm not saying everything needs to be a, uh, you know, a robust uh, bushel of action. Uh, just uh, I'm ready for a fight. That's all I'll say. Yeah. I, yeah, I think it might be a, a slow build up yep. to really explosive action. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, it, it, I, I think the show will deliver on some explosive action. But I think, yeah, we, we still got some building up to do. And we know that some scenes are still coming. Uh, we're not going to mention them because there's, we have some listeners who haven't watched all the teasers. But, yeah, there's still some stuff that we've seen in the teasers that we haven't seen yet. So we can kind of extrapolate uh, from them. But what I was really um, interested in is I feel like both of the timelines kind of left off on uh, – on Boba's two wars, right? Mm. Of I have to think that he is going to respond to what happened uh, to the Tuscans. Mm -hmm. And he explicitly says, okay, in, in the Kremler timeline of like, Fennec says it, the Pikes are gearing up for war. This is just the first wave. And Boba Fett says, we'll be ready. Yeah. Which it invites this great question of like, okay, how? <laughs> yeah. What does that mean to you? In thinking about these two wars, as these, these you know, twin stories march forward together, is this going to be a story of how he handled two wars differently, uh, one in the past, one in the present, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. um, it, and I think for me, there's this big question of, it, for the, the the Tuscan horror, did the Nictos really do it? Or were they framed by the Pikes? Or were they sent by the Pikes? Were they working with the Pikes? So is the entire story of Book of Boba Fett uh, sort of Boba Fett versus the Pikes? Yeah, right. And And, and there's some, yeah. Clues as to maybe that's the case. And, and you're right to point out, too, uh, Boba Sitt says we're ready for a fight. Um, so a little bit of like, you know, is, is he going to go out and bring it to them this time around? Maybe that's something he did in the past. Or is he just going to sit back and, hey, if they want to fight, we'll be ready. That's something, too, which is why I'm not expecting a total knockdown drag out fight next week. I'm just ready for war. No, I, I'm expecting that in the Crime Lord timeline that Boba Fett is going to try unification, right? Yeah. That he is going to try to, hey, let's all work together. Um, and you know, mm -hmm. some of that is, uh, is there are clues out there, uh, but I'm excited to see how well or poorly that goes for him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at the risk of, uh, of opening a scar, I do want to bring this up that, uh, from my, uh, viewing of the Tuscan tragedy, um, th there's the very clear shot of the leader's body, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there is the shot of uh, Boba Fett putting the leader's uh, a staff uh, on the pyre, uh, the the child's uh, training weapon, um, and uh, and what I believe, uh, you know, a third weapon, which I believe is the warrior's. Mm -hmm. I don't think I physically saw the warrior's body. So mm -hmm. there's a part of me, I, this is not a prediction, this is a hope and a question yeah. of, I wonder if there's a possibility that the warrior survived. I, I think it's a very real possibility. Yeah, it, it seemed uh, they were very uh, deliberate in, in the shots they were showing us, right? So that made me, I think I had that thought too. And I, I think I've seen some of those thoughts out there as well. So yeah, I'm right there with you on that. Yeah, so uh, a question, and I guess from my perspective, a hope. We'll see where the story goes. Uh, I have a last uh, jokey prediction, Ken, that mm. will not come true. Mm. Uh, but I, the the episode was turning around in my mind when I went to bed. My wife was already asleep, and it, it amused me, and I had to try not to laugh out loud and wake my wife. What if we're all excited about Book of Boba Fett, and next week uh, the the, sh the shots open up? It's a nice long shot of that uh, Bactopod, but then the camera comes over it, and it's the Gamorrean in there. And then we go into the Gamorrean streams for the whole episode. This is what I want more than anything now. <laughs> more than anything. <laughs> you know? And maybe he dreamed of he wanted to uh, free Ula and maybe run away and, and give them both freedom for a different life. Uh, maybe he had some problems with some of the uh, weak way there. Like, hey, let's get into the history. Let's do it. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to see it. We always like to end on a fun question about toys and merch. That's a fun part of Star Wars. If you could have any merch based on this episode, what do you want, Ken? So, yeah, uh, uh, some merch and some clothing. Uh, Boba on a Bantha, I want in all <laughs> forms. Sideshow, Black Series, Funko Bops. Much like I collect Han on a Tauntaun. 
I have a ton of Han on Tauntaun uh, stuff, Black Series Funkos, uh, little Hasbro toys, everything. So Boba on a Bantha is, is my new thing I want. Um, and then the second thing for me is uh, we need a, a bathroom FET line, a line of uh, FET uh, ropes, <laughs> uh, FET uh, sleeping underpants. Uh, I am here for it and I want it. Yeah. And even if you can actually get the valet droids to dress you, I want the, the valet droids to like, you know, prop my, <laughs> my Boba Fett uh, sleep line on. Yes. Yeah, that'd be absolutely great. Uh, I absolutely want a very large, uh, sleepy time, depressed Bantha body pillow to hug at night. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Love that. Love that. Absolutely great. Uh, And then I absolutely, very sincerely, uh, three and three quarter, I would love, if not uh, the whole most Vespa gang, I would love uh, Drash uh, on that Mm. Beautiful uh, blue uh, hot rod speeder. I would love an action figure of that. And if they actually made it in real life, (laughs) uh, I I would want, I would actually just want that blue bike with the way too many rear view mirrors. Uh, Yes. Yes. Ample, ample mirrors. Ample mirrors. That's a, (laughs) Mm -hmm. that could have been the title of this episode. (laughs) Ample mirrors. Maybe I'll write a poem called Ample Mirrors later today. Uh, Any final thoughts, Ken? Uh, No. Hey, we're always here for the larger discussions uh, outside of Star Wars that relate to Star Wars. And we hope, uh, uh, we hope we handled it uh, to, to your standards as our listeners uh, and uh, always open to more conversations. And uh, again, this is a time to go online. And uh, if you do, uh, sometimes I don't, but go online and just kind of see the conversations out there to at least uh, offer a, understanding and and pause uh, put your own ego and your own defense mechanisms of uh, star wars or anything and put it on the shelf for a second and just see what's out there um but also uh, been loving the series uh, tuesday and wednesday has been a fun uh, star wars experience for me as a fan so can't wait for next week cannot wait for next week yeah i echo everything you said i really hope that this uh this chapter is and perhaps the rest of the storytelling is an opportunity for nuanced conversation and uh, just for really listening in in hearing uh the voices uh, that that have a uh, good perspective on some of the issues that are being uh being raised in this show and very very excited for next week i wait for it uh just like uh, it, it is a big fun holiday every week mm-hmm. when boba fett's gonna come on we're gonna see some deep things some cool things uh some fun things all sorts of great things uh from the book of boba fett uh, that is it. Ken, do you want to let people know where they can find us? Absolutely. Uh, we are the Force Center podcast feed. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Force Center Pod. We're on Instagram and YouTube as well. We get episodes up there in an audio form on YouTube. Uh, subscribe uh, over there. Uh, you can uh, like our Facebook page at Force Center Podcast. Podcasts available in a lot of different spots, including ACAST, uh, uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Amazon Music, Spotify, and a lot more. And more on the way. You can get merch at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. If you want to get an audio book on us, go to audibletrial.com slash Force Center. Uh, we have mentioned it in this episode. We do a limited series right now for the fine folks with the Companion. Great sci-fi app for fans and deeper discussions and those nuanced discussions. Great articles over there. But we also have a, a just a fun show called Databank Dive. We talked about Malakili recently on there. Uh, it's behind um, uh, all the things they do over the companion. So sign up over there. We send out the tweets for that. And lastly, you can support us directly at patreon.com slash force center. Uh, you can follow me at Ken Napsock or go to my website, kednapsock.com. Joseph, for you, where can they go? Yeah, you can find me on all the social media. Twitter, Instagram, TikTok is at Joseph Scrimshaw. And you can find out all my other comedy and life adventures on my website, josephscrimshaw.com. But for now, for myself, for Ken, for the Bantha that does not yet have a name, but oh, I, I really think it will. This has been the Book of Boba Fett Report. <laughs>